It's selection day in the National Football League. Hudson intercepted by Charles Woodson. Charles Woodson took it away. And there he goes, down the sideline. He's got to go. Polish off the Heisman. It's D-Day for the dealmakers as they look to rein in football's best playmakers. Oh, sack my Wadsworth. Court drop, now play. Out of the pocket, sack. He's sacked. Oh, he hit him hard. He's sacked by Wadsworth. For 18 years, we've zeroed in on the very first pick. Who will it be in our 19th year? We know it's a quarterback. Back to pass, go Here's the rush. He throws through the end zone. Touchdown! Touchdown! That is the most unbelievable touchdown play in a college football game. And back to throw. Looking pass down and out is touchdown. They got it. He scores. Take Manning. Give him six. The NFL is full of stars, but there's always room for more in the galaxy. It's blast off time for the class of 1998. New York City, the Big Apple. Madison Square Garden, the site of so many major big-time sporting events, and inside at the theater, they're ready. And some of the best players will hear from them very early. Peyton Manning, will he go first to the Colts? Or will it be Ryan Leaf that goes first to the Colts and second to the Chargers? Charles Woodson, the Heisman Trophy winner, we'll hear from him very early. And the running back that everybody covets, Penn State's Curtis Enos. It's the 63rd annual selection meeting of the National Football League. I look forward every year to just saying that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Berman, and welcome inside here to the theater, along with my usual compatriots, Mel Kuyper and Joe Theismann. We have Tom Jackson up on the demo uh, set. We're everywhere. Chris Fowler at our college gang up in Connecticut. We are all over the country. And to steal from Chuck Berry's sweet little 16, we're really rocking in Boston and Miami FLA. We're up the coast in Jacksonville and Cincinnati IA. All right, I'll stop now, which is too good to pass up. The first pick in Indianapolis, a later pick in Green Bay. We're live in the heart of Texas and out on the desert in Arizona and with the most intriguing player early on in West Virginia with Marshall's wide receiver Randy Moss. We'll video teleconference into the Jets and Giants and Baltimore. And Carolina and Tampa Bay and New Orleans and Kansas City and St. Louis in the Windy City in Minnesota, the champion Broncos and San Francisco. Frankly, we're going to run up a hell of a phone bill. Radio, wall to wall, ESPN Radio, noon to 6, ESPN.com, and that's not it. And welcome back to New York. We are eagerly anticipating the start of what may go down in history when we look back 10 years from now as the high watermark draft of the entire decade of the 90s. The Indianapolis Colts have been, hmm, which quarterback do they go with? Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf. Our Mark Malone is out in Indianapolis. Let's get the last word before it's official. Mark? Well, the last word is that Bill Polian and Jim Moore, this organization, Boomer, they're not making it public in terms of who they've decided on. They spent uh, many hours last night, very late, trying to separate these two quarterbacks. Bill Polian had told me that uh, earlier in the day, they had them about a tenth of a point apart. They were very, very close. They spent most of the night separating those two. And I had probably one of the most interesting philosophical discussions about quarterbacks with Pullian that I've had in a long time. For about an hour last night, we discussed the pros and cons of these two guys. First of all, Pullian says that he's not enamored necessarily with big, strong guys, although both of these quarterbacks are six foot five. Peyton Manning, it seems to me, is the guy that has the most experience, and that ultimately is going to be, I think, the difference in this draft. He played the extra year, certainly, as he came back, 6'5", 230. He's got more game time experience. He prepares well. Again, the nickname, the caveman, that he's been tagged with by his teammates because he watches so much film. And when you look at all the intangibles that Bill Polian really researches and looks at in a quarterback, especially with the track record this franchise has had over the last decade or two, in terms of quarterbacks, they need to make the right choice. He's not saying Boomer, but I can tell you this. In my gut, if I was playing poker with him, I think it's going to be Peyton Manning. I think if we had to go out on a limb, that would be our guest. But you know what? They earned this four months of keeping everybody in suspense. Let them keep it for another 15 minutes. Let's go quickly to Mel Kuyper and obviously Peyton Manning and Ryan Leaf, who guys are going to talk about at length and hopefully at length for the next 12, 14 years. 
Let's look at overall value. How would you rank the board specifically on the best players available? I think when you look at it, Chris, Andre Wadsworth could be the next Bruce Smith. Arizona trades down, still gets the best player on my board. Charles Woodson, dynamic, pure cornerback. Then the two quarterbacks, the cerebral quarterback in Manning, the gunslinger in Leaf. Keith Brook, a versatile kid, can play middle linebacker, can play outside linebacker. And, of course, Curtis Enos, very, very well-rounded running back, outstanding pass receiver out of the backfield. Then there's a drop-off. After those top four, the grades slip a little bit. Then you pick it up again with the Keo Spikes, an outstanding middle linebacker. A couple players to watch. Kyle Turley, because of his versatility, can play guard or tackle. And Grant Wistrom has definitely moved up into that top ten because of his very consistent motor. The most intriguing story of the day will be the wide receiver for Marshall, Randy Moss, who I did not see right there. What happens with him? Well, the off-the-field concerns certainly are there. Not on the field. Of course, at Marshall dominated the Mid-American Conference. Those 44 touchdowns really stick out. He was a man among boys when you talk about how he dominated cornerbacks in the MAC. But those off-the-field concerns, and Roy is a wide receiver. He still has to develop his skills, getting off press coverage, route running. But for Pro Bowl talent, he may be a man among boys, as you say. Well, we're about ready to tee it off. And on the first tee, Commissioner Paul Tagliabue. Good afternoon, good afternoon. And thank you for being here. Welcome to the National Football League's 1998 player draft. We'll start with the Indianapolis Colts having the first selection. The Colts are now on the board. So while the Colts, quote, think it over, <laughs> Joe Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf, both have potential to be stars for a long, long time. Do you have a preference? Actually, I don't necessarily have a preference because both bring a lot to the table. These are both very good athletes. They're both very big, young football players. When you take a look at the opportunities that they've had to play, you have to take a look at the experience that Peyton Manning has. He's played a lot longer. As a matter of fact, Ryan Leaf played two years in high school, two years in college. Peyton Manning played all four years in college, so he's played more just in college. Leadership. Because Manning has played more, he has that ability, but Ryan Leaf jumped up a lot in his senior year. Maturity, again, because um, Manning has played so much football, he gets the edge there. Physical skills, Ryan Leaf brings just a ton of natural talent. And the conversation that you have with the personnel people and the coaches regarding these young men is the upside in Ryan Leaf is terrific. What you get from Peyton Manning right now is a wonderful, polished athlete. Both of them bring a lot of assets to this table. I think both will fit very well with the teams that they wind up with. Well, each owner brought jerseys of both. And by the way, whoever team it, that they don't go to, let's say, let's just say, the Colts pick Peyton Manning. I wonder how much that Ryan Leaf Colts jersey would be worth at a charity auction. In 1983, John Elway was drafted first by the Baltimore Colts. Do you remember? Baltimore selects oh, no. as the first choice in the draft. Quarterback John Elway of Stanford. As I stand here right now playing baseball, I said I don't want to be a, a, a jerk or anything about it. I said, uh, We've been telling you for three months that I'm not going to play in Baltimore. And I know for a fact you've been offered three ones and a quarterback, and you turn that down. And, it's just, and right now you have nothing. Of course, John Elway never took a snap for the Baltimore, then Indianapolis Colts, quarterback for the Denver Broncos, and of course will be receiving his Super Bowl ring before opening day. The Broncos, John Elway, of quarterbacks who have started six games or more since 1983. He's the only one. What have the Colts done since then? Jeff George, Jim Harbaugh. Pierre Trudeau, Mike Onion, Pagel, Chris Chandler, Gary Hogaboom, Paul Justin, a smattering of who they've had. 20 years ago, they drafted Burt Jones in the first round, and he worked out. But Elway never became a Colt. Arch Schleister was a first-round pick. They have a chance to undo a lot of negative history in the quarterback. I don't mean that Jim Harbaugh or Jeff George weren't good players, but maybe not to the degree of Peyton Manning, who brings special talent, starting with his release, almost releases the ball too quick, doesn't he, Mel? I'll tell you, when you look at Peyton Manning, his size, he's over 6'5", you look at that 230-pound frame, really an extension of your offensive coordinator. Statistics prove them uh, out what I'm talking about in terms of his accuracy. I mean, he is on target with virtually every pass, and a very underrated arm strength. But really what sets Peyton Manning apart is this ability you see here. Check off, read defenses, and show poise under pressure, and the touch on the football. 
He's a, really a pitcher. He's not a thrower. He's really rounded off his game as a passer. And I'll tell you, the arm strength, watch him here. You know, stick it between a defender, get it in the end zone. And when you see accuracy, I think that's what I'm talking about here. On the money, he knows how to get it between defenders. And watch this. This is the improvisational skills of a guy who can think on his feet, keep his poise, make something out of nothing. And that's what Peyton Manning does on a very consistent basis. And as I said before, what I like about Peyton is he can elude the initial defender, and he has that ability to loft the ball, Joe. And that's an instinctive quality that only the great quarterbacks really possess. You know how big this draft is? It's not very often that we see the owners of the first two teams. That's right. Jimmy Ursay is going to bring the card up for the Colts here in a few seconds. Alex and Dean Spanos are here, the ownership of the Chargers, to bring their card up with the second pick. And as we speak, Jim on cue. Very exciting moment for him and the entire Colts franchise. And the question now becomes, will the RCA Dome, a.k.a. the Big Horseshoe, will that become... Peyton's place. With the uh, first pick in the draft, the Indianapolis Colts select quarterback, University of Tennessee, Peyton Manning. moment for Peyton, his family, his saw his brothers, mom and dad, and of course Archie Manning, who excelled with a very poor team for years and years in the New Orleans Saints. The jersey's ready, and here he is, the new quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts, Peyton Manning, and I guess we must do this. Golf fans know this cheer. In Indianapolis, you can now yell, Peyton! You the Manning! <laughs> I think it's a great choice, Chris. I mean, he I believe that he's going to fit in so perfectly. And really, when I had a chance to talk to the organization over the last two weeks, they've sort of pointed themselves towards getting ready for the Peyton Manning arrival. His athletic ability, his quickness. And Mel, you brought up something else. Remember during the college season, everybody talked about the little pitter-patter steps that he used to take. When you watched him in workouts, they were gone. He's very conscious of what needs to be done to correct his skills to make himself play at the next level. He's coachable, he's teachable, he's very smart in his approach to the game of football. You're really getting the perfect student as well as a fine, fine young man. I know, Joe, but just a note of caution. I think we tend to expect too much from young quarterbacks in the National Football League. They're force-fed, they're scrutinized really as rookies. I think it's unfair. I think he needs to be brought along slowly. Sure, he'll be the starting quarterback on opening day more than likely, but still, you have to go through those growing pains. It's not the SEC any longer. I think too often, yeah. Joe, quarterbacks that first, second year are talked about as busts or booms. I think it's far premature. I don't think it is in the case of Peyton Manning. See, I get to disagree with you in the first 15 <laughs> minutes of the show, which is a rarity. But I really think that in the case of Peyton Manning, you're going to see his statistics at the end of the year probably look like a three or a four year player. I think he'll be able to adjust that quickly. I really feel like this young man can adjust that quickly to the game of football. The Indianapolis Colts are going to need him. They're a football team that's not very far away. Offensively, they're in pretty good shape. Tom Moore takes over as the coordinator. Rusty Tillman takes over as the defensive coordinator for Indianapolis. Rusty will run an aggressive style of defense. They get Jeff Harrod back in the middle. They're soaring up that side of the line. Offensively, good tight ends, good running backs. I think there's a lot of people around him to be able to allow him to be successful. And he should start right away. And I think in the Bill Polian, Jim Moore era, the Indianapolis Colts, the key player for Peyton Manning will not necessarily be who he has up front. It's going to be Marshall Falk. If a big-time running game can go with a nice, young, maturing quarterback, this will be a treat. Yep. Marshall becomes key to how Peyton Manning does, who is now with our Mike Tirico. Michael. Okay, Chris, thank you. Peyton, one of your endearing qualities is that you are such a team guy, and you gave your team the credit all the time at Tennessee. Will you at least take this moment to feel proud of your accomplishment? Well, it's an honor, Mike. There's no question about it. I'm really excited about what's ahead and just uh, proud that the Colts put their faith in me. I'm looking forward to the challenge of uh, getting the program going, and uh, it's a really exciting time right now. Everyone was playing great poker from the Colts' side. Were you at all concerned that you weren't going to be their selection? 
I had a pretty good idea, Mike, uh, but uh, I can keep a secret too. There's no question about that. But like I said, really excited. You know, going to Indianapolis today and looking forward to visiting Mr. Poley and Coach Moore. And I'm just, I'm excited to go to work. I'm ready to get started right now. Quickly, how keep it? How long have you been keeping that secret? I can't tell you that either, Mike. <laughs> Let's we'll talk to you later. Okay, Peyton Manning, the Colts' number one pick. He wore his dad's old number, number 18. He couldn't have it at Tennessee, Chris. All right, Mike, and congratulations, Peyton. He can keep a secret. So can the general manager of the Colts, Bill Poley, and is with our Mark Malone. Let's go out to Indianapolis right now, Mark. Well, Chris, we said that, or I said at least this morning, I wouldn't want to play poker with Bill Poley, and he has kept a secret so well coming up to this draft. You and I spoke at, at length last night. You still didn't really indicate to me where you'd go. Tell me in your heart of hearts, did it take you until late last night to really come down to this decision, Bill? No, not really. Uh, I, I think sometime around midday uh, yesterday, uh, Jim Moore and I sat down and, uh, and we said, you know, what's in our hearts? We've, uh, we've uh, done all the research. We've done all the uh, uh, measurements that you can do. And in the end, uh, it comes down to making a, a, a very tough pick. These are two very, very fine football players. And uh, we just felt that Peyton, because of his experience and his maturity level in the game of football, not personal maturity, but in the game of football, fit best for us in this particular situation. I'm confident that Ryan Leaf is going to go on and have an outstanding career, and uh, I wouldn't bet against him playing in the AFC Championship game in the not-too-distant future. Speaking of his maturity and his experience level, does that mean that this kid comes in and starts right away, he's at the top of your, your depth chart? Well, we're going to start him out there, and, and, and we'll see where it goes. We'd like, it, we're going to throw him in, whether it's game one or game four, I, I think is immaterial, but he's going to learn on the job, that's for sure. Well, Bill Polian has certainly put his brand on this particular franchise with a number one overall pick, Peyton Manning of the Tennessee Volunteers. Now, let's take it back to Boomer in New York. All right, Mark, thank you. So Peyton becomes now the ninth quarterback to be drafted number one overall since 1970. Drew Bledsoe, the Patriots, 93. Jeff George, Indy, 1990. Fellow named Troy Aikman, who won three Super Bowls for Dallas in 89. Vinny Testaverde, the Bucks in 87, John Elway, 83, Baltimore, but of course never took a snap there. Steve Bartkowski, a very good quarterback, 75, Atlanta, 71, Jim Plunkett by Boston, won two Super Bowls with Oakland, and a fellow named Terry Bradshaw, 1970 with Pittsburgh, who won four Super Bowls. So it's pretty good pedigree, Peyton fits right in. Why is San Diego on the clock? They moved up from the three overall spot to the two spot, which was owned by Arizona, and they paid quite a price. They shifted first-round picks. It cost them a second this year. Eric Metcalf, linebacker Patrick Sapp, and Bobby Beathard surrendered the first-round pick in 1999. But they felt they just had to make the move. One position we just couldn't afford to wait any longer it was a quarterback position. I think our, it was unique to us, you know, that... Uh, right now, in the position we're at, we needed to address the quarterback position if we had the opportunity to do so. And it was there, as expensive as it was, it was there for us to, to, to have that chance, so we, we took advantage of it. The amazing thing in this draft is that we were in third position, and I don't know when again you're going to find the two teams in front of you where one team doesn't need a quarterback. If we're ever going to be there and you know get to the position where we want to be, in the league, uh, you can't do it without one of those guys. And if we're right in our evaluation that either one of these guys can take you there, then um, I think it was a deal we had to make. One thing that Bobby Beathard has never done in his history, and of course building the Super Bowl champions in Washington and a Super Bowl team in San Diego, before that years around the league, Miami, he has never drafted a quarterback in round one or in round two. He's done pretty well in round three to eight. And back when they had drafts up to round 17, he drafted. And there's one of our favorites in the league, Sid Brooks, longtime equipment man, gentleman extraordinaire for the Chargers. And he, he doesn't know what to do right now. Who do, who do we pick? He's who also possibly could we pick? Gee, maybe it's the guy on the camera right now. I, Ryan, <laughs> gee, I, I guess it would be maybe we'll go out on a big tree here. Ryan Leaf, I think, is obviously a natural fit. I felt like each of these guys would be a natural fit for their football teams. The thing about Ryan Leaf is he brings a, a swagger to the game. It, there's an upside to Ryan Leaf that nobody's quite sure of because he hasn't played as much football as Ryan Leaf. He's got tremendous feet for a big man. He can back out, look left, turn and throw right as well as any smaller quarterback I've watched film. 
and looking at a lot of it, I can tell you, he gets rid of the ball quickly, he moves very well for a big man, throws extremely well on the run. The only question you have is how long is it going to take for him to be able to be comfortable at this level? If you're going to compare him to one football player that's come out in recent years, he definitely would have to be compared to a Drew Bledsoe because he's that type of an athlete. Well, he, he moves a lot better than people would think. Oh, yeah. Someone at, at 6'5 and a half, 245, and it led the team to the Rose Bowl and a bomber in the air, Coriel, Dan Fouts mold. He's in a good stadium, isn't he, with a little bit of history? Let's go to the commissioner. With the uh, second choice in the draft, the San Diego Chargers select quarterback, Washington State University, Brian Leaf. The hugs from the Leaf Brigade, or I guess we should call it a forest, why not? Because there's lightning bolts here adorning the theater in New York. Ryan Leaf from behind stage to front and center. And like I said, great pedigree with throwing the football at San Diego. He stays on the West Coast. And he only had 32 members of his family here last night. Why not? I said it's a forest. It's great. <laughs> it should be. You're right. And you know what's best about these kids is we, I say they're kids, but these young men who we've gotten to know a little bit, and I don't know either of them well, but they're just fun to be around, in addition to fun to watch play football. They are, and in sitting with them last night, having a chance to visit with them, both of them have made this simple statement. They're ready to get it started now. They're ready to get it going. They want to get on to the next level of their life, and, and now the moment has come. Is the ceiling higher in your mind for Ryan Leaf? Mel, than it is for Peyton Manning as, as Alex Spanos, the owner of the Chargers. He brought two jerseys, too. He could file that Manning jersey and sell that at a charity auction. There he is, Ryan Leaf, 16. Is the ceiling higher on him, perhaps? Well, I really believe, Chris, when you look back at this trade, San Diego moving up from three to two, five years from now, it may not look like Bobby Beathard gave up enough. This kid has tremendous potential, great physical ability, throws the ball all over the field. And I think when you look at San Diego, they were fortunate to have this pick. They tried to trade away the 98 first round pick in the second round last year. So Bobby Beathard, fortunate to have that choice to get a Ryan Leaf. Touchdown 33. Of course, he was the guy that led that team into the Rose Bowl. Really carried that football team on his shoulders throughout the season. You see the ability to throw across the body and still throw strikes down the field. That's why his accuracy is questioned sometimes, because look what he tries to do. Always that gunslinger doing whatever he can to get the ball in the hands of the receiver. Remember, this kid's 245, 250 pounds. So defensive ends coming off the blind side or attacking the, the uh, pocket are not going to be able to intimidate Ryan Leaf or take him down very easily because he can shrug off defenders a la Roman Gabriel, the former Ram. And what you really like this year was the Boys. You see how you know, he's not flustered. Mike Price, I thought, worked with him last summer, quarterback coach, head coach with the Cougars, and Mike Price deserves a lot of credit for transforming Ryan Lee into this great quarterback that he was this season. And now he goes, Joe, with, with assistants like June Jones and right. Joe Bugle. Who has the better situation, Lee or Manny, or are they both very good and very nurturing for them? I, I think you have to compare their situations, not just to the coaching aspect, but the people around them. For example, from a coaching standpoint, I think it's fairly even. I think both of them will benefit. Bruce Arians in Indianapolis, June Jones in San Diego, excellent quarterback coaches. They're both in systems that will allow them to develop as quarterbacks. Offensive line, I think Leaf has a little bit of an advantage right now. San Diego went out and got Aaron Taylor and John Jackson to really handle a terrible problem they had. Skill positions, I think the advantage goes to, uh, to Manning a little bit. And the last part would be the defense. I think also Manning gets a little bit of an edge in Indianapolis. Ryan Leaf is going to have to go in and grow up with this football team. Peyton Manning is going to come into a football team that has a lot of pieces in place. So if you're Manning coming in, I think the expectations will be higher because the football team has a little bit more around it. I'm almost sure that Peyton will start in week one. I think Ryan Leaf may not start for about a month. He may wait behind Wheelahan. But if you're looking at the schedule, week five, October 4th, San Diego at Indianapolis. Will it by then be Leaf against Manning? Something to point out very early in the season. 93, we had the identical situation. When Bill Parcells played the same sort of bluff, was it Bledsoe, was it Meyer? The Patriots took Drew Bledsoe. Rick Meyer never panned out in Seattle, and now he's in Chicago. In 71, it was 1-2-3. Jim Plunkett with Boston. Peyton's dad, Archie, with the Saints. And Dan Pastorini with Houston. 
Arizona is now on the clock. Will they trade down? We know it's Andre Wadsworth, but yet so does everyone else. The calls are coming in to the desert. They'll spend the full 15. There's the war room. It's an Acura 24-valve B6, like the Acura NSX. It's the power of sequential multi-port fuel injection, like the NSX. It's four-wheel independent double wishbone suspension, like the NSX. It's comfortable seating for five, like two and a half NSXs. It's the TL from Acura, the true definition of luxury, yours. What's the matter, clown boy? You need to make a call, but you don't have the change. Just use 1-800-COLLECT. Go ahead, make some calls. You'll save a bundle. <laughs> That's great. Mine's 1-800-COLLECT. Ten cents a minute every evening. Troy Aikman is back to pass. He's looking, looking, look out. Oh, Aikman goes down. He had a man wide open. What was he thinking? Brute. It's all part of the game. All right, guys. Same play. It has the power to move you. It has the power to take you places you never knew existed. It is, of course, your Visa card with the power to get you a seat to Michael Tilson Thomas in the San Francisco Symphony at Davies Symphony Hall. So bring your Visa card because you can't get in using American Express. Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. One word? Dominating. Dominating. Speed. Quick. Bruce Smith. Intensity. Relentless. Devastating. Performer. Wow. Dion. Exciting. Exciting. Athletic. Playmaker. Skill. Plastic. Smooth. Athlete. Scary. <laughs> We've had the quarterback time. We may not have another quarterback drafted today in the first three rounds. May not. But now it's the time for Andre Wadsworth and Charles Woodson, two tremendous players who may make this draft, along with two quarterbacks, one that we shall never forget, for those of us that love and follow pro football. Mike Golick is out in the desert. Let's check in with him right now. Mike? Thanks, Boomer. Well, Audrey Wadsworth is their man if a deal isn't put in front of him. As we're speaking, uh, Vice President of Player Personnel Bob Ferguson has been on the phone in the war room talking to some of the teams or, or getting involved in some conversation. Uh, but if no deal is done, Audrey Wadsworth will be the man. Let's send it back to you, Chris. I think, guys, thanks, Michael. I, I think that when you heard Bill Coley, and who ought to know a little bit about Bruce Smith, say, well, how would you describe Andre Wadsworth? Bruce Smith, we have not had Mel and Joe, a lineman, a pass rusher, ranked this high since Bruce Smith and Ray Childress came out in 1985. That speaks volumes. The pick is up to the commissioner. So Arizona obviously has held all calls. With the uh, third pick in the draft, the Arizona Cardinals select defensive end from Florida State University, Andre Wadsworth. Fittingly, in Arizona, the defensive line coach for Vince Tobin is one of the greatest of all time. Joe Green and the Steel Curtain. And now he has Eric Swan, Simeon Rice, and Andre Wadsworth. Along with Aeneas Williams at a corner. Folks, I know this Cardinal team was 4-12, and 12, but you put those three guys on the front line with one of the best corner cover guys in football. This is a dictating defense. Well, it really is. Look at all the close games the Cardinals lost last year. That may not happen in 98. They have also a great young quarterback in Jake Plummer. Wadsworth, 275 pounds, a la Bruce Smith. Look at the sack total and the pressures. This is a guy who played defensive tackle and nose tackle until this year. Look at the way he uses his arms and hands, strong hands. Well, he gets off a block tremendously well and then has that great speed. Look how he closes on the quarterback there. That's what separates him. Look at the athleticism as well coming up here. This is what you're talking about. Athletic 
athletic ability, speed, dominating qualities. Watch this play against Ohio State. That's what separates Andre Wadsworth from all the other great defensive ends that have come along. He's a special player, even more special than his playing ability, Chris, as a person. Great character. He's going to be a major asset to the Arizona Cardinal football team, majorly on the field, but as well as off the field and in the locker room. So much to remember about the Arizona Cardinals here. I, I'm not putting him in a Super Bowl. But this is a team with a fifth-place schedule with a dictating defense. The Giants wrote a fifth-place schedule to the division championship last year in the NFC East. Arizona moving up the board. Boy, they have made some big changes since Bob Ferguson went out there and, and helped them organize their drafts. Charles Woodson, he should be next. We'll be back. What should you expect from a dealership when you're shopping for a new car or truck? At Bill Utter Ford, you can expect a dealership that takes care of the little things. A dealership that makes buying easy. At Bill Utter Ford, you can expect an utterly affordable deal. Like 1.9% financing on 98 Mustangs, Explorers, Escorts, Rangers, Tauruses, and ZX2s. It's been 42 years that Bill Utter Ford has been serving North Texas, and you don't stay in business that long if you're not taking care of people. Bill Utter Ford, utterly affordable and utter satisfaction. I'm not hiding anything. If someone buys the DBS system from you, isn't it true that they still have to purchase programming? Isn't it also true DBS customers are responsible for their own service and installation? I have no control over that. But with cable TV, you've already got all the top-rated channels. There's no equipment to buy, and service and installation are guaranteed. I don't think that's relevant. Isn't it a fact, sir, that DBS can actually cost much more than cable TV? I don't recall. If you're thinking about DBS, you might want to think twice. Cable TV, the best value in home entertainment. I haven't done anything wrong. Your neighbors are nice, huh? Turkey's finally got a kid his age to play with. He seems to have fun playing over there. Kind of like it, too. <laughs> if your kids play at a friend's house, please find out if the parents have a handgun. Oh. That's nice being alone for a change. the clock and dressed as only Raider fans can in New York they're ready to see if another Heisman Trophy winner goes to the Raiders uh, Charles Woodson we will see as the Raiders are now on the clock with about 11 minutes to go now the Raiders well we were going to go to Miami for a moment but let's go quickly up to New England and Sal Palantonio Sal what's brewing Boomer I just heard from uh, team owner Bob Kraft who said that all week long the Raiders have been trying to get the Patriots to move up to that fourth spot to take Charles Woodson. The Patriots love Charles Woodson. They would love to have him at cornerback. They think they'd be set for 10 to 12 years in their division. It would really give the rest of the teams a bunch of headaches in their past defense, which wasn't so good last year. But the Patriots say that the price is way too steep. What I hear is they're asking for is both number one picks, the 18th and the 22, as well as a second or maybe two seconds to go up to the fourth spot. Mort? Well, Sal, it looks like the Raiders are going to have a, quite a parlay, or at least they're attempting quite a parlay. Obviously, they will take Charles Woodson with the number four pick if there's no trade, but they are also trying to get into the top ten at the number seven spot with the New Orleans Saints trying to get Randy Moss, the Marshall wide receiver. Uh, the holdup here is that the Saints, with this deal, w along with a couple of second-round picks, the Saints are demanding next year's first-round pick from the Raiders, and right now the Raiders aren't giving. Chris? All right, guys, thank you. Always interesting when the Raiders are on the clock with it. We understand the pick is coming right in. they they, they got to go with Woodson. I mean, now all of a sudden, corner, which was such a strength position for them for years and years and years, back from the days of Willie Brown at all, all of a sudden, the guys that they've had, they've been fine players, but are very long in the tooth. Let's go up to the podium and Commissioner Paul Tagliabue. With the uh, fourth pick in the draft, the Oakland Raiders have selected defensive back, University of Michigan, Charles Woodson. It's, it's the only pick that I think the Raiders could have made. Even though the trade for Eric Allen has gone through, Eric Allen has now decided that he will report to the Raiders at the quarterback position. You still have Albert Lewis, Larry Brown, and Terry McDaniel. 
uh, Larry Brown probably will be gone in a short period of time. Albert Lewis and Terry McGames have been there, I think, mm -hmm. since the turn of the century. So, I mean, that's a position that was certainly a need position. Even though John Gruden, an offensive guru, comes in as head coach, you still stop people from scoring. That's the best way to win. I think it's a great addition. Oh, right. 30th overall in defense, 30 in pass defense. I mean, I, I think we know what's happened. And again, they have collected yet another Heisman Trophy winner. Desmond Howard now plays for him. Bo Jackson did. Marcus Allen, of course, excelled for him. Led him to a Super Bowl win over... Oh, I forgot, Joe. Thanks, that was. Jim Plunkett led them. Oh, I forgot, Joe. Jeez. Jim Brown, a Heisman Trophy winner. And, of course, way back when, Billy Cannon, a Heisman Trophy winner who played for the Raiders in the glory days in the 60s. And by the way, what's interesting in the stands, Jet fans and Raider fans are nearby, and they're taunting each other. We haven't seen this since the 60s, <laughs> since Ben Davidson and Ike Lasseter were rushing Joe Namath. It's great up here. But Raider fans, Jet fans yelling at him. At any rate, Charles Woodson, offense and defense, he's always there for plays in the biggest game. No question, Chris. I think Deion Sanders may have better recovery speed, but Charles Woodson is that kind of impact player. Great players make great plays. This is early in the year and really a game that everybody thought was kind of even. He set the tone for Michigan season with this interception against Colorado. Sent Michigan on to an undefeated season, Colorado to a disappointing 5-6 and six record. Here against Michigan State, human highlight film type INT. Here's another touchdown reception against Penn State. Shows his versatility there. Watch against David Boston here. Physical style. He won't back down. He'll get up there in the face of the wide receiver in press coverage. Never back off. And here's the difference maker when you talk about great plays. Ohio State, key game, punt return, 78 yards for a touchdown. This is what I'm talking about, Chris. Consistently, even with the pressure on, we were talking Heisman Trophy here against Ohio State. Interception against B. Miller in the end zone. Every spotlight game. Rose Bowl against Ryan Lee in the end zone. Preventing a touchdown goes up and makes the uh, interception against Kevin McKenzie. You just can't minimize that type of ability with the spotlight on Charles Woodson. Really, Chris, from late September on, he was talked up as a Heisman candidate. He came through big time in the clutch. Well, he's a primarily a defensive player who is always around the ball. We got one of those ourselves. 14-year linebacker with the Denver Broncos. Tom Jackson, who's uh, who's with us here in New York. And Tommy, we're going to talk a little bit about Andre Wadsworth, a player who all defensive players drool over when you think about watching him. Welcome to New York, and how come you don't have to wear a tie? What do you got, connections? Well, Andre Wadsworth was certainly, I think, the best player in this draft, be of certainly need uh, as being an aspect. The next best player in this draft, I think, was Charles Woodson. What you get in Wadsworth is you get a ball player who is polished coming out of college, possibly and potentially better than Peter Bulware. Great technique artist, fast off the corner, has great leverage with his body. Charles Woodson is a playmaker in the mold of a Raider. He is going to be a get-up-in-your-face guy, play six inches off the line of scrimmage, and he certainly might affect the picks of other guys down the line as we look through the AFC West, because when you consider the fact that Sean John Springs, Dale Carter, and now Charles Woodson are all in the AFC West. You're going to have to have receivers to counter that. So certainly, I think we've looked at, as in the last two picks, Wadsworth and Woodson, the best two players in this draft. I'll be loving to watch them the next 10, 12 years. Well, they're all excited in Arizona, Tommy. Let's head out to the desert and rejoin Mike Golick. Mike? Thanks, Boomer. Well, the Cardinals got their man in Andre Wadsworth. And Vince, first, all trade uh, aside, is Andre Wadsworth the man you would have taken regardless, or was there another player possibly? There really was, and we had decided uh, quite some time ago that Andre Wadsworth was our man, and uh, we were just waiting to see if there's a blockbuster thing that uh, we couldn't afford to pass up. But it, it, the closer it got to the thing, no matter what they'd offered, we were going to take Andre, because you, you draft the complete package, and we feel like Andre's a complete package. Now, I know the phone was ringing yesterday, and this morning I saw uh, Bob Ferguson on uh, one time. Anything that really came about that made you hesitate at all? Well, we've had some offers and, and some very legitimate offers, but as I said, uh, uh, it kind of, you know, called our, our hand type of thing because we decided that uh, Wadsworth was the guy we wanted and no matter really what was offered, boy, we were going to stick with him because we feel like that, uh, that he's the guy that can help us get where we want to get. Now the starting left end for the Arizona Cardinals? Well, you know, I never give anybody anything. You know, you have to earn it on the football field, but uh, I would be awful surprised that if he's not starting somewhere and by the time we start ready to play. The Cardinals get their man, Andre Wadsworth. Many felt the top player in the entire draft, including the two quarterbacks. Chris, back to you. All right, Mike and Vince Oman, I'm telling you folks, watch out for Arizona this year. They're on the move. 
And now the draft has been going at Mach 12 right down the highway. We are at the point where it starts to make a left-hand turn. Chicago is on the clock. This is the Curtis Enos spot, but he is coveted by St. Louis, by Jacksonville, by maybe New England, by lots of teams. Do the Bears make a trade, or do they keep the pick? Curtis Enos, Dick Vermeil, and Mike Ditka coming up as their teams make their selections, and the saga of Randy Moss really gets started. We'll be back. looking after your money you do have goals to reach are mutual funds getting you there how do they see things at janice they look for opportunities one at a time not categories not trends just great companies to invest in no matter what the market's doing you can find them if you look hard enough and janice does get there janice no load mutual funds Renting a car is part of your vacation, right? Don't worry. So Alamo thinks it should be part of your fun. Drive happy. That's why every time you rent from Alamo, you get our guarantee of unlimited smileage. And with Alamo's great drive happy deals, you got lots of money left for the fun stuff. Don't worry. Drive happy. Drive happy now. Woo! Hey, Dale. Hey, thanks. Sure, no problem. Bob. Hey, it, it may not be much, but I think the right end is lifting just a little bit in the turns. I'll have it checked out. Oh, okay. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Saturday, Kelly. Sure will. Be good. This ESPN News presentation of the 1998 NFL Draft is brought to you by Janus No Load Mutual Funds. By Alamo, renting a car should be fun, so Alamo puts you smiles ahead with drive-happy deals and services. And by Miller Lite, who reminds you that whenever you feel good, it's Miller time. <laughs> and now it's time for the, one of the most legendary franchises to pick. I have to do it. The Chicago Bears. There's about seven minutes left for them on the clock, and their phones are buzzing. Let's head down to news on the Bears. Let's go to Miami with Chris Mortensen. Mort, what's brewing? Well, Boomer, you're right. Their phones are ringing off the hook. They are talking with Jacksonville, St. Louis, and New England, and here's the deal. They want two ones. They want both of Jacksonville's ones, which Jacksonville hasn't been willing to give up. They want them both the New England's ones. If they don't get the deal they want, Mark Hatley, the personnel man, now making the picks for the, uh, for the Bears, will take Curtis Enos, the Penn State running back. He really likes Curtis Enos. If he trades down, then they're looking at a linebacker like Tequil Spikes of Auburn or Keith Brooking of Georgia Tech. Chris? All right, Mortimer. Well, the Bears will probably use up all the time because that's one of the few positions. Remember, they just paid money for Edgar Allen Paul Bennett from the Packers. They have a salon, you know, they, they, they have some players there in a team that badly needs some help. Running backs, we expect maybe four to go in the first round. Is there a big difference on your board between the top backs? I really don't think so, Chris. I think the depth at running back is outstanding. Teams know late first, early second round, you can get some good football players. Fred Taylor has moved up into the middle of the first. Robert Edwards is interesting. There's a durability question, but he's got great ability. Robert Holcomb, very consistent, move the chain style of running back. Skip Hicks improved a great deal as a senior this year, really moved into the early to mid second round area. So there is a lot of quality depth at the running back position, well into, Chris, the second, third, fourth round. The Bears, you know, they're in a division, Joe, where everybody else made the playoffs. So as the Bears sit there in 4-12 and 12 and need help, and really counseling, I hate to say it, in a lot of positions, right. Can they afford to just pick the running back here no. if they don't make a trade? No, I think a running back picked at this spot would be wrong for the Chicago Bears. They made the deal for Edgar Bennett. He could have played in the Super Bowl for the Green Bay Packers last year. He was healthy enough to be able to do that. You get a relatively young back who's had a lot of great playoff experience, and now you're going to go bring in a younger one. I think they have much more needs. Obviously, the defensive line is a situation they need to address with the problems with Alonzo Spellman. They have nobody to compliment the wide receiver position. You've settled down at the position with Eric Kramer. Eric Kramer will be fine at quarterback if you give him some people around him. I think they need people to put points on the board. You made the point, Chris. 
everybody in that division gets to the playoffs. Yes. You get there by scoring points. Chicago has not done it. They need skilled people in that position. That's where I'd have to say they go. Defensive line and or in the wide receiver area. You know, they haven't had a pro bowler since 93. So they need, they need yeah. big time playmakers somewhere. There's about four and a half minutes left on the clock with the Bears. Let's check in with our Chris Myers in Dallas. Chris, what have you heard? Well, moments ago, Chris, I spoke with John Shaw of the Rams, and at that point, uh, the Rams are calling the bluff of the Bears. Of course, the Rams want Curtis Enos, someone Dick Vermeil has talked with personally, and it's a need for the Rams, but they're not willing to trade with Chicago. And if Chicago goes ahead and picks Curtis Enos, then the Rams will go with Grant Wistrom, the defensive lineman, also one of the areas of need for the St. Louis Rams. So at this point, the Rams aren't willing to move. They're going to wait and see what Chicago does. They have Enos and Wistrom rated about the same, with Enos being the priority simply because that's more of a need position. Chris, back to you. See, see thank you, Chris. One of the things, I mean, St. Louis just wants to come up one spot, but the price that San Diego paid for Arizona makes the Bears think, well, they can get a similar sort of windfall of picks or maybe players, but in this case, it's running back, not quarterback. That may not be the case. We'll be back with the Bears. We all know how a dog reacts when he sees something he really likes. Unexpectedly, I've noticed the same behavior on this young man. Can you turn this into something good? They sprayed us good, huh? Yeah, good. But we'll be okay, huh? I mean, we've been sprayed before, huh, Hank? I can't feel my roots, Hank. I can't feel my roots, Hank. Hank! Roundup, no mercy, no pity, no weeds. We asked some of Hollywood's hottest stuntmen to try Degree. What's body heat activate? As your body heat rises, Degree releases extra protection when you need it most. I, I heat it up and it cooled me down. I was on fire and I was dry. Body heat activated Degree. Your body heat turns it on. The touch of revolution is sweeping the land, but we must keep eating. Wipe the salsa from your chin. Salute Gorditas and our glorious leader. Gorditas, thicker, hardier. Their bold salsa and three cheeses are filling the lives of the people for just 99 cents each. Viva Gorditas! Coming this summer, it's a lot more of the NFL on ESPN. Starting July 28th, the NFL Tonight with host Mark Malone. We'll have news from around the league every night, Tuesday through Saturday on ESPN2. Then, starting September 6th, NFL Coco. Now starting at 11 a.m., a full two hours of news, inside stories, and live reports from around the league. Then, review the day on NFL Pratt. Starting at 7.30 this year with in-depth highlights of all the day's games. And then right after primetime, it's Sunday Night Football. From Labor Day to after Christmas, 17 weeks of the best teams, the best players, the best rivalries in the NFL. A full NFL season, all on ESPN. Now we're ready for, for some football, certainly all fall long in the next two days. When you're saying the card has gone up, there's about a minute left. Uh, on the clock for the Bears. Let's go to the commissioner. With the uh, fifth pick in the draft, Chicago Bears select running back Penn State University, Curtis Enos. I, I, I tell you what, I, I would not, and this is on no inside information by this particular, I would not necessarily rule out a, a trade in which Enos doesn't end the weekend of Bear, although Absolutely. lately those things haven't happened. No, I, I agree with you, Chris. I, it's, it's not that the Bears can't use a player like no, Curtis he's a great Enos. Player. He's certainly a terrific football player, a terrific young man, and, and the Bears want to add that type of a quality player to their roster. But I think that there are other areas of needs on the Chicago Bear football team that can, could have been addressed in this draft, and I think will be. I tend to agree with you, Chris. I really feel like Curtis Enos may not wind up past Sunday being a Chicago Bear. At least they have him in fold now. I think it's it's not the, necessarily the move you want to see. They didn't get the deal they want, but this gives them time now to be able to work on a future deal that maybe may even get them more players 
more picks, and of course, more opportunity to help their football team. Although worse things could happen, Mel, than just lining up Curtis Enos and letting him be a big, bruising back in a cold weather ballpark. Well, you're right, Chris. I think when you look at Kajana Carter and Blair Thomas, everybody says, are you afraid of Penn State back? Well, Lydell Mitchell, Franco Harris, Kurt Warner had great careers coming out of Happy Valley. I look at that size, 240 pounds. You also see some outside speed. Not a lot of creativity or elusive qualities, but we're talking about a 240 plus pounder who has a speed to take it the distance. Look at the inside power. Great tackles between the tackles. You're talking about a guy that certainly can keep the chains moving very effectively. He is a tackle breaker. There's no question about that. And he plays four quarters. In the fourth quarter, he'll wear down defenses. Watch him here. Number 39 coming down the field, making the catch. A lot of receptions during his career at Penn State. So he's multi-dimensional. He's 240 pounds. And what I like about him is he's going to create yards. Not through creativity or elusive but throw sheer power and determination. He will not take, he'll take one tackle, two, three. It, it's going to take a gang tackling situation to bring this kid down. Like I said before, when you get into the latter stages of the fourth quarter, and it's a close game, and you can ride a Curtis Enos for a drive to get into field goal range, what have you. This is the kind of kid that could become very valuable taking pressure off of Eric Kramer. Well, six yards of carry last year, 19 touchdowns. And, you know, one thing you should remember about Curtis Enos, he was originally... Uh, drafted, uh, recruited by Joe Paterno as a linebacker. So there may be some question about Penn State running backs. No question about Penn State linebackers, but there is a question about their running backs in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it. After they, they have not hit many. Out, they have not hit many out of the park. Look at the running backs that they've had under Dave Wanstead in Chicago. Yee. Anderson, Worley, Haywood, Tillman, Yee. Hodge, Yee. Green. Yee. Hodge. I mean, Ronnie Harmon, Hicks, Salam, Harris, Carter. Lewis, and the list goes on and on and on. You'd, one, you'd think that the one area that the Bears probably would have stayed away from might have been the running back. But again, the pick is okay as long as he doesn't stay there. Well, Joe, what I think the point you have to make here as well is teams tipping their hands too early. Everybody knew St. Louis had really wanted Curtis Enos. And you tip your hand early, everybody, you're, you got the bullseye. You're the target for everybody to move ahead of. And you let everybody know a month ahead of time what you really want. And I think that's a mistake a lot of teams make. And St. Louis certainly went into this draft wanting Curtis Enos. But let me just, one other point. We, we all sit here and say there are others. Maybe this was a terrific move by Hadley. Maybe this was a move to say, okay, now I'm holding the aces. Well, now right. what are you going to do? That, that's what I said. That's ex you're exactly right. Now come to me with it. See, I, I think there's know, no clock on this train. That's right. You see, there, there's a difference. So St. Louis, the Rams, and Dick Vermeil in the year two of their regime is uh, is now on the clock. Grant Westrom here, Chris Meyer said that's what is out there. But there are teams now that are running back hunting. One of which is New England. Let's go up to Sal Palo Antonio. Just like Mel said, Boomer, not only St. Louis, but New England was definitely interested in Curtis Enos. Of course, losing Curtis Martin to free agency to the Jets, they have a hole, they have a need to fill there. But when they were on the phone with the Bears while the Bears were on the clock, the Bears were asking for both first-round picks this year, 18 and 22 from New England, as well as a first-round pick for next year. And team owner Bob Kraft said that's just too much to mortgage for one guy. So it's back to the drawing board for the Patriots as they go hunting for another running back. Now let's go to Chris Mortensen in Miami. Well, Sal, some people surprised by Curtis Enos going to the Bears right now, but Mark Catley, the personnel boss, and Dave Watson, the Bears coach, have talked out the scenario. And, and the next step then is to remove the transition tag from Raymond Harris, who's coming off the leg injury. That frees up another $2.5 million that they may use to target free agents after June 1st. So there is a plan in effect uh, to take that tag off Raymond Harris. Chris? All right, Mortimer, thank you. So St. Louis stays put, though, with number six, and Chicago, of course, taking Enos. And they go with, well, they know the big 12 players out in Missouri pretty darn well. And with a guy with a motor that can rush the passer inside, Grant Wistrom, that's expected to be the pick. Draft, the Rams select defensive end, Nebraska, Grant Wistrom. Well, this certainly adds up. And Mel, he is a... He's a heck of a player. Ray Childress, kind of a 
his style a little bit. Very right? consistent, Chris. I think you see 273 there. He could have been 255 and been an outside linebacker in the right scheme, but certainly for the Rams, he will be a defensive end with Kevin Carter on the other side. Talk about the consistent motor. Boy, this kid comes hard every play. And when he gets in the backfield, he's trying to not only get a sack, but strip the football. And I think when you look at the intensity, takes you down, he takes you down hard. He's also strong. This is against the University of Washington against Brock Hewitt. So he's looking at a guy very disruptive throughout his career. Of course, Jason Peter on the inside, Wistrom on the outside. He also has a lot of power in his pass rush for somebody who's only between, say, 255 and 270 during the later stages of his college career with the Cornhuskers. So Grant Wistrom, drafted by Dick Vermeil and a uh, someone I think he thinks he can just plug right in and probably move him on the depth chart to start. Let's go up to our defensive wizard, Tom Jackson. And, and Tommy, talk about a player with a motor running. We found one right here in Wistrom. I think the thing that you have to know about Grant Winstrom is Grant Winstrom is 275 pounds, six foot three, from Nebraska, the two-time Big 12 Player of the Year. He has great balance, and let's take a look at the things that he does well. When you talk about Grant Winstrom, he's a guy whose motor is on high all the time. He is a complete package. He has great balance. You see him right there attacking the football, and that's the thing about Grant Winston. He creates a lot of fumbles. Watch his balance here as he comes off the corner. Right there, you're going to see a guy try to get into his legs. He cannot. He stays up and upright. And watch the anticipation of the cut block here. Watch his hands. We'll run it back for you again. Watch his hands. And the thing that you want to demonstrate here about Grant Winston is that Grant Winston has great balance. I think the only question may be his weight at 275 pounds standing up against some of the great offensive tackles in this game. So we take a look here. Jack is going to be down. The offensive tackle, as I come around the corner and he tries to cut me, it's all about getting the hands on somebody, getting them down, and getting up and over. But Grant Winston is an outstanding pick, and again, I think there's a premium in this league and in this draft on defensive ends who can get around the corner and rush the pass. Tommy still has some of those moves. It's, it's good to know. He, he, was, he was working pretty quickly. Every three years, the Rams, L.A. or St. Louis, go defensive line. First pick, Bill Hawkins, 89. Sean Gilbert, 92. Kevin Carter, 95. Grant Wistrom, 98. Carter, Wistrom, now a tandem up there, Joe. Well, I think you got Carter and Wistrom a tandem. You also have Farr, Agnew, and Robinson on the front line. The thing that I like about uh, the addition here is you lose a Leslie O'Neill, an outside hard-moving pass rusher. All of a sudden, you've replaced him with a much younger one. The sack production is really the problem. That's why they went for the outside rusher. 6.5 out of Carter, 3-0 out of Farr, 2-0 out of Agnew, nothing out of Robinson. And in the top reserve is Jay Williams, who wound up with two sacks. So you just don't have a lot of sacks coming out of that defensive line. This is an opportunity to add speed, add youth, add power to a defensive line that is fairly young when you take a look at them. So I think it's a good move and a natural fit for the St. Louis Rams. Well, there was no way they were going to dabble with Randy Moss no. after the Lawrence Phillips debacle. But here are some teams who could, either here or elsewhere. New Orleans with Mike Ditka, Dallas with Jerry Jones and company, the Randy Moss saga, Jerry and the boys, Mike Ditka and the Saints are on the clock and we return. Welcome back to the theater in New York. I just want to get on record right here as saying that when we look back 10 years from now, the best draft in the 90s at the top will probably be this one. This is the most prolific top we think we're projecting since 89, when four of the five picks were pretty much as good as you can get. Troy Aikman, Barry Sanders, Derek Thomas, Deion Sanders. Not everyone makes it to the Pro Bowl as Tony Mandrich was graded so high and did not. But four of those five are great. We have the two quarterbacks. We have Wadsworth. We got Woodson. We got Enos. Just file that one away. Now, here's a curveball. Chris Mortensen in Miami. Morton, what do you have? Well, the Saints are on the board, and I've talked to Mike Ditka, and Kyle Turley, the San Diego State offensive lineman, he told me that Turley reminds him of Jimbo Covert, his great Bears left tackle. That tells you that's the guy they're going to pick unless they trade. Jacksonville clearly talking trade swapping, which means Turley would be available still at nine, I think, and also obviously New England. The target there, uh, well, why don't we go down to go up to Andrea Kramer in Jacksonville to find out.
That's right, Moore. You've got to get your geography right. The Jaguars are talking to the Saints. The player that they do want is running back Fred Taylor. They missed out on Curtis Enos. They were speaking to the Bears. They, uh, the Bears wanted two first-round picks and a starting player. Tom Coughlin did not want to part with that. They would like to get Fred Taylor uh, at the seventh position. If he is gone or if, uh, if they aren't able to get him, if they do stay at the ninth position, look for them to take linebacker Takeo Spikes or defensive tackle Bonnie Holiday. Chris, back to you, New York. All right, Andrea, thank you very much. And Mord, will, that's been on the board that New Orleans, if they kept it, would probably go Turley. But now we really begin to watch where Randy Moss may or may not go. Of course, his on-the-field production at Marshall in two years, tremendous. Look at the touchdowns, 44 TDs, most of them in the last uh, two years, 25 touchdowns in last season. However, to boil it down, high school days at West Virginia, Two counts of misdemeanor battery. That pretty much nixed him. He was on his way to Notre Dame. Then Bobby Bowden took a shot of him at Florida State. But while he tested positive for marijuana while serving some time, that nixed his potential career at Florida State. While at Marshall, charges that were later dropped but continue to have some trouble. Do you take a risk and just go with him because he's a great football player? Or is there a red flag? Here's the views around the league. Randy Moss is on our draft board right now, rated as a first-round pick. Uh, when we actually stack our board, then he won't be on the board. I don't think you can judge people on other people. Uh, I think that if, if, if the New Orleans Saints and Bill Carrick or Mike Dick judges Randy Moss or anybody else in Randy's on a Lawrence Phillips, you're doing a disservice to Randy Moss. You have to judge every player an individual an individual situation you can't lump them together i just think if you're going to invest the first round pick in a player there better not be any question marks in regard to his past performances off the field you have to err on the side of caution because uh, it can be very destructive to your salary cap it can be very destructive to uh, getting the right type of guys in and, and being able to pay them so uh, sometimes you may miss on a guy who is going to come in and do very very well but you have to play the percentages. Well, I don't write bad character. I write past history of whatever it was. Uh, do I think that can be changed? And then I put down yes or no. Do I think it can be changed? Yes. Do I think he's changed already? I think he's in the progress of trying to change. Whether he's changed or not, I don't know. I find one of the most telling sound bites in there was Tony Dungy. Remember how Warren Sapp fell a few years ago and fell into Tampa's hands? They got themselves the best defensive player of that draft. There's how things can change, and you play the percentages. Let's go to Andrea Kramer, who might be playing the percentages, Andrea. Well, Chris, I had a chance to read some team scouting reports and psychological assessments of Moss. And due to character problems, which are obviously well documented, there's great concern by this one team scouting report as to how Moss would potentially handle a high-priced multi-million dollar contract. Now, they also, the scouting report also detailed how the lack of discipline was affecting his work habits. One scout questioned his ability to lead or if he would accept criticism. And one scout went so far as to say that to their, the best of their knowledge, Moss had not even been really yelled at by anybody at Marshall, so how would he respond to that type of, of discipline it, once he got into the pros? The psychological test that I saw, the summarization was, until he develops more self-discipline, he will be his own worst enemy. And it was from, this was from a psychological test that is administered to many players uh, throughout the draft. Now, as for his on-the-field performance, scouting reports say he can basically do whatever he wants uh, on the field. However, the flip side of that is one team's report, which says they wonder how he'll be able to get separation from his defenders and how he'll handle bump-and-run coverage in the NFL. So, certainly a wide variety of opinion, Chris, on Randy Moss. Uh, no question, Andrea. There is a wide variety of opinion, and someone who is dialed in right now is our Linda Cohn in West Virginia spent yesterday with many of the officials at the thundering herd of Marshall for whom Randy Moss starred and led them to the Carquest Bowl last year and and of course the playoffs the year before in Division One AA and is now in Charleston West Virginia right now and is at the location where Randy Moss is and what's the feeling there Linda are they, are they excited are they nervous do you, do you have a feel on the situation well, Chris, can you be relaxed and anxious at the very same time? That's what Randy Moss is doing right now. And yes, I am at the home of his advisors. And a lot going on, and they are looking forward to uh, what could happen. Randy is just anxious to prove his point out on the field. Um, 
you know, when I spoke to Randy in length yesterday, as well as a little bit this morning, uh, I spoke to him about, and I asked him, what would happen when, uh, if the Saints do select him? What would happen if uh, Mike Ditka would yell at him for the very first time? And Randy turned to me and he said simply, you know what? You know how you prevent the yelling? Doing your job and, and, and performing and doing well. And that way he wouldn't have to worry about dealing with a, a Mike Ditka and, and the yelling and potential adversity on the field. He's not even thinking about that. During my visit to Marshall University yesterday, I spoke to the coaches, I spoke to the teammates, and this Randy Moss that's being talked about by some NFL teams is simply not the Randy Moss that they know. Well, he hasn't been a bad guy around us, you know. He's been here two years and he's done everything we've asked him to do. He's adhered to our uh, very strict uh, rules we have for our football team. He's made every practice. He's not had a crossword with a coach. It's amazing to see how much people base on perception. And they make their points of view and their opinions before they even meet a, a person, before they even get to know the person. And when you do that, uh, you can totally get somebody wrong and, and be mistaken. And I think a lot of people are mistaken about Randy. All I can say is I just think his actions just speak for themselves. The team, it's a lot. Like a couple of years ago, the, Michael Jordan get, didn't get picked first, but now everybody regrets it. And I think that's going to be the same thing that happens with Randy. We know Randy can outrun anybody, but can he outrun his past? No, he can't. And, and his past is, is in the past, and I think his future is spotless. Randy has matured a lot. I think they're piling on. I mean, they're just rehashing old things. When Randy faces adversity in the NFL for the very first time, how do you think he's going to react? I think adversity is... It might slow him down a lot, but it'll never stop him. Just because uh, he, he, he never lets it stop him. He may get down a little bit, and he came through all the adversity through negative things in the media, but he's still pumping. He's still going as hard as he can. I think he's totally made a 100% change. He's totally turned things around, and he's done great things for us here at Marshall. And whoever picks him in the NFL draft, we'll be very lucky to have him on his team. Whoever gets him, I guarantee you. We'll be doing somersaults. One more note, eh? another psychological evaluation that was given to and made available to the Bears, Dolphins, and Saints by a New Orleans psychiatrist said, in summary, this young man under the right system should adjust quickly and respond positively in a most consistent manner. So it's not all negative, at least from the psychological standpoint for Randy Moss. Chris? Hi, right, Linda, thank you. We'll check in with you off. And of course, we were watching the, the clips there. And you know, in that Motor City Bowl, I call it car quest, but I got the, the <laughs> autos mixed up. You know, six for 173, six five to run like that now. On field, no question. Well, I think you, know, you still need to work at wide receiver, great physical and athletic ability, Chris. But I think teams have to have a philosophy about off the field concerns. Either you look at that strongly, or as Bill Coherick of the Saints said, you analyze each player individually. I really think, looking back a couple years, had Lawrence Phillips gained 1,500 yards, Randy Moss would have been a top five pick. Well, the. Uh clock is run down on the New Orleans Saints. Let's uh, get their selection. With the uh, seventh pick in the draft, the uh, New Orleans Saints select tackle San Diego State University, Kyle Turley. Dallas County. Well, I, I, mean, I hate to say it, we're going birdie par, birdie par. I mean, we're it's kind of gone right down the list so far. Here's a young man coached by one of the best, Ed White. No question. I think Ed White did a tremendous job with uh, Kyle Turley. You see the strength there, a dominator at times, very good run blocker. Remember, he came out of San Diego State. It's a program, Ted Tolner, with that wide-open pro-style attack. So he's a, a lineman who can also run block as well as pass block. So he's going to come into the league ready to play. And I think when you look at Kyle Turley, very active, gets down the field, sustains, always looking for somebody to take out of the play and advance that runner down the the field and I think when you look at Kyle Turley there you go Chris that's Kyle Turley yeah wow well then he you know you go to San Diego State did he hurt that surfboard <laughs> I thought you liked that one Chris hanging 10 <laughs> I know I know he's gonna press iron Joe he's gonna hang a lot of 10s I tell you that. he's gonna join a lot of offensive linemen where he gets a chance to hang a lot of 10s Chris Dioli, remember, was the first pick last year. He fits right in. William Rolfe, one of the finest tackles in football. Andy McCollum, Jerry Fontenot, the center, comes over from Chicago. Clarence Jones at the right tackle. You project exactly where you want to put this young man in, and he's going to find a place in a very young offensive line. I don't care 
how good a skilled people you have if you've got a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, unless you have an offensive line that can block. And that's what it looks like Mike Ditka is trying to do. He's really trying to build this football team around a good offensive line, then add his skilled players. He's going about it the right way. I like this decision. It's the perfect fit for New Orleans at this particular spot at this time in Mike Ditka's coaching career. You know, they had a pretty good defense, but they need yeah. to move the football a little bit. And now, well, maybe now we hit it into the woods. Dallas is at the eight hole, Jacksonville at the nine hole. Does New England move up to make a trade to get eight in the running back of their choice? Or do the Cowboys wheel and deal, or do they just take that pick? How about them Cowboys? How about them Jaguars? We'll be back as the draft saga unfolds. I'll be back on Tuesday. The number's on the fridge. I color-coded all your meals so you won't be confused. The blue one is a beef dish. B is for beef. The pink one's a pork dish. P is for pork. You get the idea. The green one is for vegetables. It should be violet for vegetables. But I thought you might see violet but think purple and interpret pork, which would defeat the whole purpose of convenient color-coding altogether. Four minutes on high. Stir halfway. Bye, guys. So what do you guys want for dinner? Blue or pink? Did somebody say McDonald's? I hope Mom color-coded breakfast, too. She gave you life. She gave you her laugh. She gave you confidence. She gave and gave and gave. Well, isn't it time you gave your mom a call? MCI Five Cent Sundays. Five cents a minute, every minute of every Sunday, along with low rates all week long. Call 1-800-SUNDAYS to become an MCI customer. It has arrived, the day when you stop listening to the tales of other lives lived and begin the odyssey that will be your story. When you find the destiny to which you were born, all you need to bring with you is your honor, your courage, and your commitment. It's your journey. Make it a good one. Call 1-800-USA-NAVY. Let the journey begin. We continue from New York tonight at 7.30 Eastern Time. NHL, last weekend before the Stanley Cup playoff, the St. Louis Blues, hey, they're very dangerous out west against another playoff-bound team, the Phoenix Coyotes. 7.30 tonight. That game is out in the desert. All right, so we've had seven picks. Dallas and Jacksonville are up next at 8 and 9. Let's go up to our gang at our uh, studios at uh, home base in Bristol with Chris Fowler and company and pretty much right down the middle of the fairway so far as far as the players that have gone guys Chris thank you I wouldn't know about that down the fairway stuff but you're right 73 minutes into this draft still waiting for our first surprise probably most of the mock drafts you read in the newspapers this week had these seven players going in this exact order only the third time in history quarterbacks go one two in this draft no surprise, the Colts kind of played some games late, but Peyton Manning selected with the number one overall choice and his experience given is one of the main factors. Manning, 41 starts in college, as expected, will wear the Colts jersey and a strong indication that he would start at the top of the depth chart when camp opens. Ryan Leaf going number two, something he is ecstatic about. He's already looked at real estate in the San Diego area. It's an area that he has visited every summer since junior high school. Beyond that, the picks unfolding as expected. But now the X factor of round one becomes Randy Moss. Mike Ditka and the Saints passing on him at number seven. Mike Gottfried, Randy Moss will continue to be one of the stories until he is selected. Let's first talk about the on the field attributes of Moss. Well, Chris, there's no doubt he's a great athlete, a game breaker type player uh, that's done a lot of things for this Marshall football program. He has excellent speed. Of course, we know that he has excellent size. He has a change of direction for a big receiver. In two years, he had 168 pass receptions, 53 touchdowns for Marshall University. Shows his athletic ability here. Catching this pass from Pennington, he shows speed. He shows cutting ability. He shows a hurdle here at the end. Strength of a stiff arm. He gets in the end zone. He really is an outstanding talent. Now, he has a high upside. 
I mean, high. <laughs> he has a downside as big as the Grand Canyon. And the downside refers to some of the off-the-field stuff. But getting back to Randy Moss as a wide receiver, at times it looked very easy, and it was very easy for Moss in the Mid-American Conference. A lot of defensive backs didn't come up, didn't challenge him. They were afraid they were going to get beat deep. What about Moss as a receiver and things that, that might be a red flag, excluding the off-the-field stuff? Well, you look at all the good things, Chris, mm -hmm. but when I had him in the Motor City Bowl, he runs undisciplined routes. And the thing that bothered me the most about Randy Moss was that as I'd watch him play, he'd take a couple plays off. He'd play hard three plays and then take a couple plays off. He looks like he lacks concentration, and that could be a problem for a coach uh, down the way. But he is a talent. But the downside is there. I really think that the concern for NFL teams is not the off-the-field stuff. It really is the question in their mind, will Randy listen? Will he listen to his position coach? Will he listen to his head coach? Because at times you wonder whether Randy Moss knows whether or not to take good advice. He's had plenty of time since the end of the season to kind of rehabilitate this image and try to convince NFL teams that he is coachable, that he will live by the code in the NFL. And at times, Randy has not listened to his agents or his coaches or his mother or his minister or anybody else. And I think that's a major concern, Chris. Will Randy listen to us? Well, that's a concern for the team on the board right now. Maybe the Dallas Cowboys who, uh, who I tell you what, this would be one of the great stories of this draft if Randy Moss ended up with the Dallas Cowboys. Just, oh man, there's a lot of storylines off of that one, aren't there? Well, news of the Cowboys' interest in Randy Moss. Let's go back to West Virginia to join Linda Cohen. Uh, Cowboys, one of the serious suitors? Uh, no question about that, Chris. There's serious interest. Uh, one of the Cowboy scouts have been staying here in Charleston at a local hotel, calling here, the home of uh, where Moss is staying, of the advisors, keeping tabs on what is going on with Randy Moss. Also, of the trips Randy made, the Cowboys, it was, he was the most impressed by that. He enjoyed meeting Deion Sanders. Sanders spending a lot of time with him, of course. And also, he enjoyed his chat with Jerry Jones. He spent about an hour with Jerry, and Jerry and, and Randy were getting along, and Randy was saying it compared it to a couple of friends just catching up on old times. But uh, Chris Myers, what is the latest in Dallas? Well, uh, Linda, I just uh, got off the phone with the uh, Cowboys war room, and they're, they're going to go uh, cold feet like a number of teams are with uh, Randy Moss, and I, I doubt seriously how much they really consider drafting Randy Moss at this, the eighth pick. The Cowboys have gone out of their way to repair an image. Calvin Hill brought in over a year ago as the behavioral consultant, and that's Calvin in the war room earlier today talking with the, uh, the brain trust of the Dallas Cowboys. Jerry Jones using psychological and uh, staff testing, psychiatric testing for the first time with his draft picks. One concern the Cowboys had in this study was any player who mixed substance abuse with violent behavior was something they wanted to stay away from, and that's an issue that, uh, that the Cowboys have had to deal with. So at this point, the uh, Cowboys are removing uh, Randy Moss from the equation at this selection. Dallas is entertaining trade discussion. The interest, as you look live in the war room, is a defensive line. Greg Ellis out of North Carolina is the player that the Cowboys uh, would select uh, if they stay at this position. That's an area of need and something that they have a concern with at this point. Randy Moss is not in the picture for the Cowboys. Now let's go to Andrea Kramer. Well, Chris, one team for whom Randy Moss might be in the picture, who are they are considering Ross, uh, Moss, although they don't necessarily think he'll be there at number 21, are the Minnesota Vikings. Dennis Green told me, this is America. Everyone deserves a second chance. But perhaps even more interestingly, they have someone on their team they think would be a very good influence on Moss, his brother, Eric, the mammoth offensive tackle that the Vikings picked up at the end of the year, they feel that he would be a good influence on him. You also have to remember the Vikings have Chris Carter, who would be a mentor of sorts. Uh, Dennis Green said, we are considering him. It is not our immediate need, but they have not taken him off the draft board as other teams have. And one thing, Chris, the scattering reports that I read interestingly said, one scouting report said, hopefully his older brother will be a guide for him and help him out. They are two totally opposite people. Back to you in New York, Chris. All right, Andrew, thank you. What is interesting here, guys, is that he could go with this pick or he could fall all the way to early second. I'm not predicting that, but yeah. that could happen. But as you look at Dallas, Michael Irvin, of course, you know, pro bowler. But since Alvin Harper left, he really hasn't had a running mate on the field, has he? No, Michael's had to really struggle on the position by himself. Look at the people. You've got Michael Irvin with 75 receptions, but anybody that's played opposite him, Anthony Miller was brought in, didn't produce. Stefford Williams, a young guy, still don't know. Ernie Mills is brought in now because Chan Gailey knows what he got, gets in that product. I think Billy Davis could be an answer for them, but only three catches, and Macy Brooks, zero. I personally think that Randy Moss, if he was to wind up a Dallas Cowboy, would be a good fit. Now, everybody would say, oh, my gosh, why? 
because I think Michael Irvin has grown up and learned a lot from his experience and can help a Randy Moss. Deion Sanders could be one of the most misunderstood players in football. This is a top quality individual who could have great influence. Both very visible men, both very strong personalities, could help out a Randy Moss an awful lot. And now you might have that player opposite Michael that'll help Troy out, help Emmett out, now help a Chris Warren who's become a part of that backfield and complete that offense. The line's okay. The wide receiver position is decent. It could be helped here. I'd be a little bit surprised if they do go this route personally, Chris. I think they need help in the defensive line more than any place in the Dallas Cowboys. But to me, a Randy Moss there, I could understand it. I could live with it. I could even almost justify it. When Jimmy and Jerry began in 89, they were 1-15. Of course, they picked Troy Aikman right away, and the move began up. Of course, they had all those bellwether picks for Minnesota, a yep. unique situation. Now, Mel, since Jimmy has left, the drafting success, of course, much tougher to draft at the, you know, at the bottom of the round, right. but the drafting success of the Cowboys, they need a home run here soon, don't they? They really, since Jimmy left, Chris, uh, their track record is, has been horrible in terms of the draft. Except that's for Larry why, Allen, That's right? why, exactly. Larry Allen, the one gem in the second round. But when you look at the uh, Super Bowl team and now a 6-10 and ten club struggling, it's because you don't draft well. It catches up with you three or four years down the road. And certainly, I think the Dallas Cowboys are on the spot today. You already saw Jimmy Johnson trading down. Now he has three second-round picks. Jimmy's working the process. He's gotten Zach Thomas, Jason Taylor, other players in the draft in the middle rounds. The Dallas Cowboys have not been able to have that kind of success since Jimmy Johnson left Dallas. Well, let me tell you what's going on right now. As we suspected at the top of the telecast, the next spot for a running back. Jacksonville will probably take one at nine unless a team moves up to eight like New England. Of course, they lost Curtis Martin in the much celebrated offer sheet to the Jets. Now, you look at the two war rooms, they are talking in New England and in Dallas. There's a history of deals between these teams. That should be pointed out. So, if, if, if Dallas moves down to 18, they should count on getting Randy Moss there too. And New England then might go up to take Fred Taylor ahead of Robert Edwards or the back that they would like uh, next to Curtis Enos. Possibility? That's exactly I think right, it's a Chris. distinct possibility. It is, and I think we look at Jacksonville. We already talked about St. Louis targeting Enos early in the process. Jacksonville targeting Fred Taylor early in the process. Everybody knew to get Fred Taylor, you have to move ahead of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I think Fred Taylor, Robert Edwards, later first round. Is he going to be there for Kansas City? New England also has that running back need at 18 with two first round picks. That's why, of course, they are thinking also of moving up to get Fred Taylor, which could allow ultimate Edwards to drop the KC. Holcomb also in the Chiefs thought process and also skip picks early to mid second round is where I think you'll see I, the UCLA product. Go. I predict a trade here. Do you? I, I, I think they pull the trigger here. Well, I think when you look at Jacksonville, you, know, you look at Fred Taylor, he would be an ideal fit. James Stewart's down there. They want to run the ball. They know they have to keep that defense off the field, which was handled up the up front. Terrell Davis had a huge day in the playoffs. So they want that running back. Fred Taylor's not there. Then they go to Keo Spikes. But Fred Taylor is the team everybody in the league knew, New England knew, the last week, week and a half, that we have to get ahead of Jacksonville. Well, plus the other thing is, is what you wind up doing at this spot now, you're really talking about swapping ones and only going down about eight to ten places. You're not talking about two number ones and the deal that Chicago wanted. So it's not a big stretch for somebody to start moving down here. Moving down from the eight spot down to 18 is not that big a move. They can still get defensive help there if they need it. They still could possibly have the wide receiver if they want to go that route. It gives Dallas a lot of flexibility. I, I tend to agree with you, Chris. I think it's a good place for a deal. Well, the suspense is killing us because the card is up and the clock is wound down. Do the Cowboys stay or do they go? With the eighth pick in the draft, the Dallas Cowboys select mm. defensive end from North Carolina, Greg Ellis. Well, we try we're trying to engineer deals here. We can't pull any of them off. I thought we'd be I thought this be our second or third deal by now. I don't think I don't think Boy, the phone's out. I don't think the phones are out. I just think that the price is too high that people are asking. And everybody that's says because of Arizona, San Diego, that's probably changed the whole climate, don't you think? Plus, this also fits a need for the Dallas Cowboys. Well, no question about that. I mean, they, they have Leon Lett in the middle, but they, uh, 
They're a little light on the outside, and Shawnee Carver is reportedly about to retire. Well, the number two ranked defense, they didn't play like it, Chris. I think teams dominated them up front. They ran the ball. Dallas could not stop opposing running backs. They had no pass rush. Greg Ellis is a very athletic defensive end. He's up to around 280 pounds. Set the all-time sack record at North Carolina. Broke, actually, Marcus Jones' old record. Here's a kid, you know, really a hard worker. I like Grant Wistrom, also very athletic. Diagnoses well. You see the ability to read and react very quickly. You know, locate the football, make the play. All obviously very consistent. You never have to worry about Greg Ellis taking a down off. He also has a long arm and the kind of wingspan that you want in a pass rusher. And we talked about Andre Wadsworth being a great kid. Greg Ellis is regarded as the team leader of a North Carolina Tar Heel football team, which the last few years was very effective under their former head coach, Mac Brown. Well, this is a spot where, hey, Greg Ellis is certainly could be a, a, an outstanding player, and Dallas hopes so, but where by not making a move or, or, or nothing being changed around the running back situation right now, that the draft has taken a turn. The defensive linemen, now they may come off the board a little bit quicker. So the trade was not made. Jacksonville is now on the clock. We take a look at New England's war room as they now go back. The front, you know, it's a little empty here because now... They're not slated to pick until 18. They'll get busy on the phones again. But now if they're looking running back, they'll have to see what goes off in the next 10 picks. When we come back, we'll talk with Peyton Manning, the number one pick of the draft. Looking pretty good with that Colt cap. We'll be back. These AC Delco parts are about the most dependable you can buy. They should really help improve your performance. Come on, they're all the same. I'll take some out of this bushel basket. Okay. AC Delco. No matter what you drive, if you're not asking for it, you're asking for it. Home Depot's philosophy is cutting edge. What does the customer want? We always got something new coming out on the floor. Things that you were wishing would get on the market, and all of a sudden, wow, there it is. It's important to give the customer everything needed to do any project around their home. Like great Grillmaster grills, the flame control system makes certain you get sure starts, even heat, less flare-ups, and perfect meat. Come see the complete line of Grillmaster grills at the great Grillmaster event. It's happening this weekend at the Home Depot. Yeah, Ted, let me put you on speaker. Hey, Netboy, tell my agent what you told me. Well, if you access my Zone Games customized box score that compiles the player's net worth, yeah, you'll see that Mr. Salmon's RBI's put him well ahead of Sammy Sosa in Fantasy Baseball ranking, yet Sosa earns five mil more. Can you believe that? Uh, don't worry, Tim. I'll give a vase on the blower. Of course, Ted. It's just a fantasy baseball... Shut up, net boy. Uh, look, I'm your agent, Tim. Let me take care of this. Shut up, net boy. Hey. Sunglasses can help you see better. They can make you look cool. Thanks. Enable you to sleep on the job. And this here, sunglasses can also help you save a life. Just watch Cure by the Shore on QVC, live from the Cannes Film Festival. Cure by the Shore is a special presentation showcasing designer accessories. Net proceeds will benefit the National Women's Cancer Research Alliance. Every pair you buy will help you see a cure for women's cancers. Designer sunglasses and accessories at half price. Saturday, May 16th on QVC. or participating Kawasaki dealers. What should you expect from a dealership when you're shopping for a new car or truck? At Bill Utter Ford, you can expect a dealership that takes care of the little things. A dealership that makes buying easy. At Bill Utter Ford, you can expect an utterly affordable deal. Like 1.9% financing on 98 Mustangs, Explorers, Escorts, Rangers, Tauruses, and ZX2s. It's been 42 years that Bill Utter Ford has been serving North Texas, and you don't stay in business that long if you're not taking care of people. Bill Utter Ford, utterly affordable and utter satisfaction. Eight picks, no trades. Greg Ellis selected by the Dallas Cowboys as the Jacksonville Jaguars are now on the clock with about 
nine and a half minutes to go with pick number nine. Let's head back down to Big D and Chris Myers. And Chris, uh, the Cowboys thinking on, on their move. Yeah, this was a guy that some people had rated a little bit lower down, but the Cowboys obviously liked him as a football player, needed help on the defensive line, had it rated right up there with Grant Wistrom. And uh, in the war room uh, earlier when they made the call, of course, Walt Juliff, head scout, says, hey, have you been in an accident in the last 24 hours? Are you healthy on the phone? Once he says, no, I'm ready to go, they put him on with the new head coach, Chan Gailey and Jerry Jones. The Cowboys were sold when they talked to Mac Brown, the, of course, the college coach at North Carolina of Greg Ellis, who's now the head coach at Texas. And Mac Brown, in talking about the kind of person that Greg Ellis is said, hey, if I died tomorrow, he's the kind of person I'd want him to raise my family. That's how highly I think of him. That's the kind of character in a football player the Cowboys are now looking for. Chris, let's go back to you. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much. Well, you talk about character. We, uh, we certainly have a man with character because the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Let's go up to our Mike Tirico with Peyton Manning and his dad, Archie. Michael? Mr. Berman, thank you very much. It's a wonderful day for the Manning family, as you would obviously understand. Uh, there can't be a more proud dad to see his son exceed what he did. Number two overall pick in the draft, number one pick. Archie, let me start with you. How proud and happy are you of this day? Well, we're, we're very proud of Peyton, and the whole thing, Mike, is just so, so exciting. As I know it is for so many parents around the country today, but... Um, Sure, Peyton, we feel like Peyton's worked hard, and he, he's been very fortunate. He's had a wonderful time at, at Tennessee, but this is just a, a great honor for him. And it, as a family, we're real proud of him. When Dad was broadcasting the Saints games, and Jim Moore was the head coach, I know Jim Moore has told the story of uh, you as a high school quarterback actually stepping in there at a, a pass in practice and being there with the team. How much of an advantage is that to know Coach Moore before you get there? Well, I'm glad that I do know him, and I've, I've known him over you know, the past couple of years, sort of being around, hanging around the Saints uh, organization. But uh, looking forward to playing for him and working for him. Obviously, I don't know him in the player-coach relationship, but I think it'll be a good relationship. As a dad, what has been the worst part of this entire four years, all the build-up at Tennessee, all the awards, what's been the worst part and the best part? Well, it, it's, it's been a great experience, Mike. I, I think the toughest part, maybe Spectre Peyton's mother, and a little bit, it was the everything for the, the Heisman. I, I know Peyton was really ready for that to, to be over. Now, this has been a lot, too. You know, and they've really raked T and Ryan across it for the last few months, but I thought both of them have held up to it real well, and this was a... This was kind of a, it was a win-win for everyone, uh, but there, there hadn't been many low times. He's had a, he's had a, he's been very fortunate throughout his college career, and we've really enjoyed following him and supporting him. Finally, as we wrap up, isn't it nice that you can wear your dad's number finally now as you go to the Indianapolis Colts, and explain why you couldn't wear 18 in Tennessee? Well, 18's always been a special number to our family. Uh, of course, my dad wore it at Ole Miss. That's what he wanted coming out to play for the Saints, but they didn't have it. My brother Cooper Ward, when he was in high school, of course, he was injured, and he's always been an inspiration to me. And uh, I'm not a real picky guy. I'm not going to go to a team just because of a certain number, but the Colts had it available, and I'm looking forward to wearing it. Uh, I'm sure Pops will now be at the RCA Dome enjoying watching Peyton Manning, Indianapolis Colts quarterback. Congratulations, and thank you from all of us. Thank you, Mike. Now back to Chris Berman. Chris? All right, Michael, thank you, and congratulations to Peyton and to Archie, two wonderful, wonderful people. Archie threw for 24,000 yards in a career with the Saints that never saw his team exceed 500. Plus, it's oddly enough that Archie's best statistical season, way over 3,000, was the year the Saints won 1-15 in 1980. They're not looking for the same records in Indianapolis with Peyton Manning, certainly, eventually. And he should start week number one. But that's the decision to be made by the new head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, Jim Mora who's with our Mark Malone. Mark? All right, thank you very much. Jim, obviously you have a knowledge of Peyton, having coached his father and been around his father to a certain extent in New Orleans. Any reservations that you might have had in this process? Well, Mark, one thing, I'm not old enough to have coached <laughs> his father, okay? <laughs> but uh, Archie did, you know, work for the Saints for the time that I was down there, and uh, I got to know Peyton a little bit, probably not as much as people have speculated that I got to know him, but uh, he came around the Saints facility a little bit there, you know, the last uh, uh, few years, and uh, I've always had a great deal of admiration for him and his family. He's got a great dad, his mom, Olivia, is a tremendous young, tremendous woman, and uh, uh, I, I, I know we got a quality football player, an outstanding young guy, so I feel good about that. How does he fit into the offensive structure you will put in place? Uh, does his experience give him an advantage in terms of getting in and out of good plays? Well, I'll tell you one thing we're going to do. We're going to stick him into the mix right away. We're not going to uh, sh sugar feed him, you know, or, 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 or go slow with him. We're going to say, hey, Peyton, you're the guy, and uh, we got a mini camp this weekend, and we're going to stick him right in there at that spot and, and let him learn as he goes along. But I think Peyton... 
Uh, his experience will help him. I, I know he's the type of person that will prepare and do everything he can to be the very best football player he can be. So, and we're going to help him. You know, we're we're going to we've got a good running game, I believe. And we're going to run the football. We we got to make sure we do a good job of protecting him. I hope hopefully play good defense, and I think that'll help Peyton too. Well, he'll have to do a lot in mini camp, or at least when he get him here, because his petition to join the Colts uh, before June 1 has been turned down, although Peyton Manning has graduated. So it'll be a few weeks before you can get going with him full bore. Until then, it's going to be an interesting interview between Jim Mora and Peyton Manning. Now let's go back to the studio. Hi, right, Mark and Coach Mora. Thank you very much. Uh, Peyton will probably not be signed by the guy. He's the guy that wants to get in and play right away until the collective bargaining agreement is officially ratified by all the players. Reason being, in a few weeks that's supposed to happen. Reason being, the signing bonus in the new collective bargaining agreement can be metered out right now only over five years, but for cap reasons can be metered out over six years. So that will give them some cap relief if they wait to sign a couple of weeks after the new CBA agreement is ratified. That's why that will wait a couple of minutes. Jacksonville's pick, a couple of weeks I should say. Jacksonville's pick is courtesy of the trade they made for quarterback Rob Johnson, setting him to Buffalo. This is Buffalo's slot. Here's the first of two for the Jaguars. Here's the commissioner. With the ninth pick in the draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select running back from Florida, Fred Taylor. Well, we knew that this was the spot. We knew that if you wanted to get it back ahead of Fred Taylor, other than Curtis Enos Mel, that you had to make the move, which is why New England and Dallas were burning him up. Fred Taylor played at Florida, so the folks in Jacksonville know him quite well. Well, they really do, and I think when you look at Fred Taylor, you see a guy who has those subtle moves, and he also has some power. Remember, you're talking about a 230-pound running back, not a fullback. He showed with that 4-3-8 clocking during an individual workout that he can take it the distance. And as I said, subtle moves, not tremendously elusive, but can break tackles, has a lot of power. And I think that's what you're looking for in Fred Taylor. Also, at the NFL level, you're going to have to see Fred Taylor improve in terms of his pass receiving skills. We know can run with the football at those two dominant games against Penn State and Florida State late in the year. But as far as rounding off his game, developing into a more consistent, reliable pass receiving threat out of the backfield is something Fred Taylor is going to have to work on. Well, he's a quote football player, and I got that from several scouts with about five exclamation points. The difference in the Jaguars last year to this year, there were two of them. I mean, two years ago, remember, they were close to beating New England and going all the way to the Super Bowl. Natron Means caught fire at the end of the 96 season, was tremendous in the playoffs until the AFC Championship game. Last year, they never had a back really catch fire, and they were way late in Denver. That's one of the reasons that they were not as successful last season. Well, Taylor really, should fill the void. You're really talking about a division that prides itself on its abilities to be able to run the football. You take a look at the running backs in this division. Jerome Bettis, 1,600 plus yards. Eddie George, to almost 1,400 yards. Corey Dillon, in a very limited time at the end of the season, just with 10 TDs. And this, you're going to remember, this guy played only the last half of the season. So this is a division where they certainly need a, a, a Fred Taylor. What Jacksonville has going for them is a limited amount of guys. They're in a situation where they just have James Stewart, who averaged 4.1. They had Natron Means. He's gone on to San Diego. And Randy Jordan is an a, 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 a unrestricted free agent. He only averages two yards. Was there a need at running back? Absolutely. There's no question. When you've got wide receivers of the quality that the Jacksonville Jaguars have, you can take time to develop a running back into a pass catcher. I personally think it's the perfect scenario for them. They need somebody to be able to control the ball on the ground more. And this kid, I think, will help them out a lot. Well, now the question is, does New England at 18, who need a running back, will they get the next one, who's probably Robert Edwards, or do teams make moves in between? Keep your eye on that as the saga of the 68th NFL, 63rd NFL draft continues. Baltimore, they talking trade with Carolina. Ray Rhodes and the Eagles on deck. And the saga of Randy Moss. Sprint is proud to announce it's hit its mark again. For three years in a row, Sprint has been ranked number one by J.D. Power & Associates for the highest customer satisfaction among high-volume, long-distance users. To celebrate, we're giving people who sign up for Sprint Sense now our biggest offer yet. Up to 300 minutes free. That's on top of the great Sprint Diamond Minute rate. Looks like we're going for four. Call now. 1-800-PIN-DROP. 
It's an Acura 24-valve V6, like the Acura NSX. It's the power of sequential multi-port fuel injection, like the NSX. It's four-wheel independent double wishbone suspension, like the NSX. It's comfortable seating for five, like two and a half NSXs. It's the TL from Acura, the true definition of luxury, yours. The reason we're here, as man and woman, is to love each other, here. take care of each other, when love walks in the room, everybody stand up. Doctor's khakis, one leg at a time. Lights, camera, action. Attention local business owners, we at Marcus Media have upgraded our commercial insertion equipment. By investing a half a million dollars in new digital equipment, we're able to deliver the high quality usually seen on national TV spots. We ensure accuracy and dependability for your commercials, which can now be inserted on 20 of the top cable networks. Marcus Media, our investments make you look better. performance for just $29.99 at these participating Metroplex Kawasaki dealers. The greatest new cars for 1998 are from James Wood in Decatur and Denton. Hi, I'm Pat Summerall, and you'll quickly discover the beauty, performance, and value of the Oldsmobile Intrigue, the Pontiac Grand Prix, and the Buick Regal at James Wood. Value reigns supreme in every new Chevrolet, and the luxury of Cadillac has never been more affordable. New Chevrolet and GMC trucks are value priced every day, where the difference is definitely worth the distance. James Wood, Decatur and Denton. Alan Amici diving into our living room. To John Madden teaching us to draw. TV and the NFL have grown up together. Monday night, you can relive it all with replay. The history of the NFL on television, including a special look back at the beginnings of Monday Night Football. Monday night at 8.30, then again at midnight on ESPN2. The education of Dandy Dunn continues. We await the punt. So we saw a sneak preview of that show on Thursday night here in New York, and that, that is must watching because we've all grown up watching football on TV. That'll be Monday night, but right now, we're all over the league as this draft is going fast and furiously. Let's start our whip around to many of our cities with Mark Malone and Indy. Mark? The Colts exercise the ghost of Dan Marino by selecting Peyton Manning first overall in this year's NFL draft. Peyton is supposed to arrive here in Indianapolis in about two hours. Meanwhile, the Colts go back into the war room. Their next pick at number 32, their needs at wide receiver and cornerback. Now let's check in with Mike Golick. In Arizona, the Cardinals get their man and Andre Wadsworth and look for an immediate impact. But the easy part of the draft is over. Now with two early second round picks at number 33 and number 36, VP of player personnel Bob Ferguson gets down to work. With only two safeties on the Cardinals' current roster, look for them to go in that area if the top safeties on their board fall to them early in that round. Let's send it over to Chris Meyer. Here in Dallas, the Chan Gailey era begins with the drafting of a defensive lineman. And live behind us, the new head coach of the Cowboys and Jerry Jones are holding a news conference. Go ahead, gentlemen. I know you have work to do. But they had need positions at wide receiver and at defensive end. A question of character came under fire with Randy Moss. And Dallas opted for Greg Ellis. It's worth repeating when Mac Brown, his college coach, told the Cowboys, hey, this is a guy, if I die tomorrow, Greg Ellis, I'd want raising my children. They said this is a character guy who can play football, and he can rush from either end as well. Right now, let's go to Andrea Kramer. Here in Jacksonville, Tom Coughlin had a need at running back. He just filled it with running back Flo uh, Fred Taylor from Florida. He stays in the state, doesn't have far to go to, to visit his new team. Coughlin tried to move up to the five slot, the Chicago Bears, to get Curtis Enos. Instead, he settles for Taylor, and uh, at the 25th spot, he'll look for 
cornerback help. Tom Coughlin yesterday went through his draft board with me. It's gone exactly as he anticipated. So Sal, let's go to Solomon Wilcox. Here in Cincinnati, the Bengals have five of the first 77 picks in the draft, two of which will be the 13th and 17th pick in the first round. Look for the Bengals to go heavy on the defensive side of the ball with linebackers and cornerbacks topping the menu. Now that St. Louis is taking Grant Winstrom, the Bengals will now turn their attention to the likes of linebacker Keith Brookings from Georgia Tech and to Keo Spikes from Auburn. But don't be surprised if the Bengals should make a reach with one of those first-round picks and take an offensive tackle to shore up depth for the offensive line. Now let's send it out to South Antonio. Here in New England, the Patriots are still trying to move up. They lost out on Fred Taylor. They lost out on Curtis Enos. And now they're talking to the Baltimore Ravens about that number 10 pick. Uh, so are the Oakland Raiders, and they are targeting Randy Moss. As for New England, Pete Carroll is probably wondering to himself, when is he going to get that stud running back to replace Curtis Martin? Now let's go to Chris Mortensen. Surprisingly, there has been only one trade in the NFL today. Not surprisingly, that was made by Jimmy Johnson and the Miami Dolphins. He is again stockpiling picks. That's his M.O. He's got three in the second round. Now let's go to Hank Goldberg. Day where Ron Wolf predicted there would be a lot of trading today. Well, he didn't let anybody down. As Mort just told you, he got out of the second round and traded up to Miami with, to get their 19th pick. He needs defensive help, secondary defensive line being the key areas. They weren't inactive here totally today. Besides the trade, they signed Doug Widell, a left guard from the Colts. He'll compete with Aaron Taylor leaving for free agency. Now let's go to Linda Cohn. We're in Charleston, West Virginia with Randy Moss, and sure, Randy wishes he would have been picked higher, but he remains upbeat, so does his camp. Why? Because the Cowboys and Raiders are keeping in touch here and saying there's still a possibility there could be a trade to get Randy Moss. Chris Berman in New York, back to you. All right, gang, thank you, and we'll be back out to all our sites, but right now on the Sprint uh, video conference, one of our uh, tools that uh, we had a lot of fun with last year, let's go out to Chicago and... Uh, and join the head coach of the Chicago Bears, Dave Wanstead. And uh, David, I guess the, the thanks for joining us and good day to you. I guess the phones are ringing off the hook, but in the end, Enos was just too good to pass up or were there deals that you're still scratching your head over that you, the Bears decided not to make? No, this was something that uh, Mark Hatley, you know, Bill Reese, Mike McCaskey, we, we, we talked about uh, for the last couple of weeks as far as, you know, what the value that we thought uh, would, you know, Curtis Enos would, would come under in this draft. And we were very, uh, very determined that, that he could help our football team and we were not going to just uh, give up Curtis Enos and drop down just for the sake of doing it. So we're really excited about having Curtis. And, and I think there's no question that, uh, that he'll have an impact on our football team and help us win games this year. Dave, one of the positions which you have now, uh, you know, some extra players were good players are at running back. I'm not asking you to predict the trade yet, but but could the Bears make some moves, keep Enos, and then move him? Mean, you got Edgar Bennett. Um, that's one of the areas where you're stocked. I imagine some well, will not be yeah. Bears next year. <clears throat> yeah, we, we are, and and that's something that uh, we've thought through. If if this situation uh, did happen like like it did today, and what we'll have to do is uh, we got mini camp coming up next week, and and we'll we'll deal with all the players and uh, at that time. Well, you've got your hands full with every team except the Bears making the playoffs. Good luck on your move up the ladder and get back to that war room. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Okay, Chris, good to have you. Dave wants that in Chicago. The pick is in for Baltimore at the 10 hole. A 10 spot. With the uh, 10th pick in the draft, the Baltimore Ravens select defensive back from the University of Miami, Dwayne Starks. Oh. Well, they lose Antonio Langham to free agency at, uh, at the corner to San Francisco. This certainly adds up, Mel. Well, it does. I think when you look at a neat area, this is a guy here that will be plugged right into a starting position opposite probably Rod Woodson. See the ability there against Florida State in a big game. That's against Peter Work, the outstanding receiver at Florida State. Here against Thad Busby again, makes the play in coverage. You see the, the closing speed there, the ability to make up ground in a hurry. Now you watch him down in the red zone area uh, on a route that's very difficult to defend for a 5'10", 170-pound corner, not for Dwayne Starks. Here you see the athletic 
athleticism and speed as a punt returner for Dwayne Stark. So as I said, Chris, only 5'10", 175 pounds, but he's a 4'3", uh, recovery speed corner. He also has great athletic ability, and he's experienced the last two years in that man coverage. The only thing about Dwayne Starks, even at Miami, despite that great ability, he did play a little soft in terms of man coverage at times. Gave mediocre receivers a little bit too much cushion. With Baltimore Ravens, they had the pass rush. With Bolt Ware and that great group of linebackers and that defensive line that played well last year towards the end, he's going to be protected in terms of coverage by that front seven. He is fast, he is tough, but he's skinny, Joe. He's, he's short. I mean, it... He's small. He's got, to, he's got to cover some big guys. He in does. That, you know, if you take a look at the division, look at the play, uh, the wide receivers that play in this division, Yancey Thigpen, and look at their heights. Not their yards so much, but their heights. Jimmy Smith, McCardell, uh, Michael Jackson, Darnay Scott, Carl Pickens. I and mean, you've got some big receivers that he's going to match up against. I personally think that to find somebody with quickness and the ability to cover one-on-one -on -one overrides the fact of him being six feet or six one. I think this is a good pick for Baltimore here. Quickness can make up for such a difference because quarterbacks, contrary to what popular belief is, we're not the most accurate people all the time in the world. I think you put the ball places sometimes where guys have to make plays. If you've got a defensive back that's quick enough to be able to be around it, he can be a playmaker for him, and I think Starks can. Now we move to the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Eagles, Ray Rhodes is one heck of a coach. There's no question about that. But the Eagles picks... Hey, this slot Where are you going with this No, no, no. The Eagles picks <laughs> lately have become what Arizona used to be, what uh, Cincinnati used to be. Other teams go, oh, they picked him. Great. Our guy's still available. A little bit lower. Ray's made some interesting picks. This is a key year for the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's go to our Sal Palantonio for some insight on Philly. Sal? Well, Chris, as you know, the Eagles have a problem with Bobby Taylor coming back from a knee injury, and they do need a corner, and they like Dwayne Starks a lot. Matter of fact, they sent down their security personnel to Miami to check out Dwayne Starks. He checked out fine, and they were planning to really look hard at taking him with that 11th pick. Ozzie Newsome, Baltimore Ravens personnel guy, knew this, and he thought, if I trade out of 10, I'm going to miss out on Dwayne Starks, and that's the reason why they pulled the trigger in Baltimore on picking Dwayne Starks. Now let's go back to New York. All right, Sal, thank you. So there's the Starks pick. And we look at Philadelphia. Well, we're going to be looking at Philadelphia for the next 12 minutes. Still to come when we return here to the theater in New York, in the bowels of Madison Square Garden. The Eagles on the board. Atlanta coming up after that. The linebackers are ready. The Eagles are on the clock, but they haven't waited that With long. With the 11th Paul the first round, the Philadelphia Eagles select tackle from Florida State, Trey Thomas. Well, Trey Thomas, well, he's seen a couple of kitchen trays he's enjoyed. 349 pounds, 6'7". Big no, man. No sacks allowed. You see that bench press of 500 pounds and that huge frame. Look how he just takes that defender to the ground. And a guy that really got better and better as his career moved along. This was his first season as a full-time starter. Remember, Walter Jones was getting all the press last year. This was Trey Thomas's season, and he was really a dominator. Huge kid. Really does a great job against the counter move because he has such a wide base and certainly can move defensive ends off the line of scrimmage. I asked Andre Wadsworth uh, earlier this year, I said, uh, who's the toughest defensive end, uh, offensive tackle you ever played against as a pass rushing defensive end? He said, hey, wasn't anybody ever played against? It was who I practiced against. It was Trey Thomas. He's so huge. He's got quick feet. Not as athletic as Walter Jones was, but he cannot counter move Trey Thomas. And Andre said, hey, in practice every day, we had some great battles, and he had the ultimate respect for Trey Thomas's ability. You know, what is not new is that the Philadelphia Eagles in recent years have gone a uh, number one pick on the offensive line. It began really when Richie, when Richie Kotite was there, Davis, Lester Holmes, Bernard Williams, Barrett Brooks, Jermaine Mayberry. So this, now Trey Thomas, it's the sixth offensive lineman picked with their early picks in the first two rounds since 91. You would think at this point they've got one heck of a great <laughs> offensive line. I mean, when you take a look at the draft, you'd go, wow, look at those guys, all those number ones. They haven't had one be very productive at all. Maybe they can break the string of the bad luck they've had. 
Let's go down uh, for more on Trey Thomas to our Andrea Kramer in Jacksonville. Andrea. Uh, yes, as for Trey Thomas, uh, there were reports, uh, we started reporting over a week ago, that he had failed a drug test for marijuana last fall, which caused him to be suspended for the Maryland game. A team general manager and, and head scout, uh, head security director, excuse me, have confirmed to us that he actually failed two drug tests, and that's the reason that he was suspended for the Maryland game. We spoke to Florida State. They confirmed their drug policy as that. If there was a second failed drug test, that a, a player would be suspended for one game. I spoke to Trey Thomas's agent, Lamont Smith, this morning. He said that he was only aware of one failed drug test, that it was an insignificant amount, which uh, did not cause uh, any concern to teams. This was clearly a concern for the Philadelphia Eagles, and one reason for that is the history of picks that they've had. They've had some questions about drug use by running back Charlie Garner, Bernard Williams, the offensive lineman, questions about uh, drug use with him. So it was heavily debated for the Philadelphia Eagles, but they went for the need, which was offensive line, and got the top-rated offensive lineman in the draft, Trey Thomas. Let's head back to Chris Berman in New York. Okay, Andrea, thank you. Next up, the Atlanta Falcons. We expect them to take Keith Brooking, linebacker Georgia Tech, which would be a heck of a player, plus help him sell some tickets down there. But right now, tickets to be sold in San Diego, I think they'll sell a few. With our Mike Tirico is Ryan Leaf and the owner of the Chargers, Alex Spanos. Michael? Chris, I'm happy folks who are waiting to make the trip back to San Diego. Ryan, let me start with you. There are so many comparisons that have been and will be made with Peyton Manning. You guys will be inexorably linked. Has your friendship starting back around the Heisman Trophy Award, has it helped both of you come through the last four months? I think so. I think that uh, um, our relationship has just grown into something pretty neat. Um, I'm really happy for him. I think that uh, for him and his family, I've become real good close friends with them. And I think that our relationship will be linked for years and years to come, um, like uh, Drew's and Rick's has, and same with uh, Archie and I think Jim Plunkett. Absolutely. Mr. Spanos, it has to be great for you to come to New York and take back with you the guy who you hope won't ever force you to go back to New York for the draft. Let me say this, Mike, and I've said it earlier and I've said it most all day, Ryan is going to be the man that's going to keep me out of New York for the next 15 years. <laughs> well, he'll be, gl he'll be glad to hear that because he had to pick up the dinner tab for his entire family this week. Congratulations, both <laughs> of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Chris? <laughs> All right, guys, thank you. Now, we, you know, Ryan asked for a nickname. We're going to do that in a minute. But Atlanta wasted no time. And they're selling tickets already, right? We, we ready? Uh, the commissioner, I understand, has the card. He does not have the card. You see? Everything was smooth sailing. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we asked in the first issue of the matter. Ryan asked me during the SBs, you know, i got to have a good nickname. I am Ryan Lee. I mean, it, it's an easy name to have fun with. And we had some suggestions written in, like, Leaf in the fast lane. Yep. Now we're going to the commissioner. Here's Atlanta's pick. <laughs> With the uh, 12th pick in the first round, the Atlanta Falcons select linebacker from Georgia Tech, Keith Brooking. Well, I'll tell you, Atlanta, we'll get back to that in a minute. Atlanta is ecstatic with that. Again, a hometown guy and a linebacker along with Tuggle in the middle that'll you know, make their defense start to make some plays a little bit more than they have. Leaf in the fast lane, which of course is going to San Diego and the Eagles sang the song. Quantum Leaf, that's pretty good. You gotta be Leaf, that's real good. <laughs> Rod Stewart, which is my suggestion, reason to be Leaf. Comic Relief, Leaf and on a jet plane, Leaf and let die, Leaf of his own, four Leaf Clover, but the winner and the one I like the most, we got it from several folks, Ryan Beyond Belief. He enjoyed the name too. He said that's a winner. So that's what he is on NFL Primetime. Ryan Beyond Belief. And of course, Brookings, another name I can have some fun with. And he's the a babbler. Great football player. I thought he was the fifth best player in this draft. You know, Atlanta Falcons team there at 12. Obviously, a neat area linebacker. And remember, Keith Brookings, he was always perceived to be a middle linebacker. He had played there most of his career. Outside linebacker this year here in the Senior Bowl with a sack. And you'll see him here against Thad Busby in Florida State. Sack again. You see a 448 speed, a 245 pound frame. Sideline to sideline defender. 
great nose for the football. This kid comes to play every week. A guy with, I think, a Chris Spielman type uh, tenacity with more physical ability. Here, 40 yards down the field, making the interception. Here on special teams in the Senior Bowl, making the play. So you're talking about a guy talked to Keith a couple months ago, Chris. He said, these individual workouts are wearing on me. I can't hit anybody. I tell you, he is <laughs> definitely that Chris Spielman style of player with a little bit more physical ability uh, mixed in. And I tell you, for the Atlanta Falcons, they got themselves one heck of a talent with Keith Brooking, with also the great attitude that Dan Reeves wants in his football players. And they don't even have to pay for the moving van, really. Well, the other <laughs> thing is, too, is you got to remember that, that the defensive line of the Atlanta Falcons did a heck of a job last year in sacks. They put a lot of pressure on people. Now you add a young speed linebacker and allow them to be able to cover down feel a little bit better you really make that defense even stronger you keep a healthy chris chandler remember they finished the season six and two you were talking about arizona being one of those yeah. up-and-coming teams i think atlanta falls into that category too they had a nice run at the end and uh you know the, the falcons this will help sell some tickets no question cincinnati is now on the board with the first of their two picks and we think that'll be takio spikes inside linebacker auburn it's pretty much gone right down the list which is an upset almost. Bengals coming up next. Carolina to follow. We'll be back. This ESPN News presentation of the 1998 NFL Draft is brought to you by Nintendo 64. Get in or get out. By Polaroid. See what develops. And by Janus No Load Mutual Funds. Back in New York, the Bengals didn't wait long. Commissioner Paul Tagliabue. With the uh, 13th pick in the first round, the Cincinnati Bengals select linebacker from Auburn, Takeo Spikes. Well, it's not like we're the only ones who could say we told you so, but now you talk about a middle linebacker. This is a guy that makes many a play. It's a great inside linebacker. Came out here after his junior year. You talk about Takeo Spikes. You're talking about productivity year in, year out. Look at that size. 234 pounds in the Ray Lewis mold. The great Baltimore Raven young linebacker. Speed, tenacity quickly reacts in the direction of the play. Uh, you know, great moves. And I think when you say getting around blockers and away from traffic, sifting through uh, an area that's really clogged, he can do it. He can create a lot of activity with that uh, run-stopping ability that he provides. Here against LSU, uh, you see his ability in coverage as well. So a guy that can really do it all, reads the quarterback very well in coverage, not to take him off the field. He can be an every-down defender. And I think when you look at his ability in space to make a tackle, this is something all linebackers can't do. A lot of them struggle early in their career it'll be a natural for Takeo Spikes. I look at Takeo and back since really September October you look at that physical ability the great speed he runs a 4-4 he's got unbelievable strength and you see a lot of the same characteristics that have made Ray Lewis and the Baltimore Ravens so successful. Fourth time the Bengals have used the first round pick in the 90s on a linebacker James Francis still there of course Alfred Williams Reynard Wilson last year now Takeo Spikes Solomon Wilcott's played some ball for Cincinnati and now he's he's playing ball for us he's in Cincinnati after reaction to the Bengals first of two first round picks. Solomon, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Right now I'm joined by Bengals defensive coordinator Dick LeBeau and coach. There are a lot of guys on the board, but you guys chose Takeo Spikes. Is he the guy you wanted? Hey, yes, he is, Sale. We liked his athleticism. Uh, he jumped out of the gymnasium in the uh, vertical leap. Uh, his 40-yard uh, time is under 4-5. He's a 230-plus pound man. Uh, very much an impactor inside with great range. We think he's a three-down player, can play on third down, and we're excited about getting this young man. A lot of people compare him to Baltimore's inside linebacker, Ray Lewis, just a maniac on defense. Is that a fair comparison? What do you guys expect from him? Well, if Spikes can come up and play like Lewis, I'll be a very happy man indeed. That's, that's a, a tough comparison to take a guy just out of college and compare him to one of the most productive backers in the, in the pro game right now. But we see the potential there to be that type of a player. Very disappointing year last year on the defensive side of the football as you guys continue to move on into the draft. I guess you can look for more guys on the defensive side of the ball and possibly another linebacker going to get the quarterback. Well, it's a good year for defense. We weren't as disappointed in the latter part of the season as we were in the early part. We think our players made good progress, and, and we're looking forward to get uh, a little more help for them. All right, the Bengals have another pick, the 17th pick in the first round. Now let's send it out to Bristol and Chris Fowler. 
Well, Sally, thank you. Always nice to welcome a former Colorado Buffalo to the team here. After the quarterbacks went 1-2 in the first round, then the run began on defensive players. Spike's latest defensive player to be taken, but it began with pick number three and Andre Wadsworth, followed by Grant Wistrom, and then Greg Ellis. So, just like college recruiting in the NFL draft, the premium on pass rushing. With the uh, third pick in the draft, the Arizona Cardinals select defensive end from Florida State University, Andre Wadsworth. The Rams select defensive end, Nebraska, Grant Wistrom. The Dallas Cowboys select defensive end from North Carolina, Greg Ellis. And Ron Jaworski joins us now. Jaws Wadsworth, a guy I got a chance to watch a lot in college. Unblockable at times in big games like when he played North Carolina. Everybody wants the guy who can explode around the corner and get to the quarterback. Well, Arizona has to be thrilled with getting Andre Wadsworth. Joe Green, the defensive line coach, now has a complete package to fill out that whole defensive line. As we go to the pre-play, what we want to see here is what they will do with their 4-3 in the nickel situation. You'll have Simeon Rice on this side. You'll have Eric Swan in here, and you'll have Mark Smith in there. Now, normally you'll get the double team right in, in there that's the guy you want the double team on of course that's Eric Swan that means this position right here Andre Wadsworth will get the single on the right tackle gives him the clean shot to the quarterback that's what you want now with Simeon Rice coming off this side and you got Wadsworth coming off this side the quarterback drops sets up there's the pressure up the middle now the other thing that Andre Wadsworth brings to the table is what teams are now doing called the zone blitz he will rush the quarterback the nickel dime, the, excuse me, the dime corner will come off the corner, attack the quarterback. Now Wadsworth, with his great athleticism, athletic ability, will engage and drop off into coverage. That's what he brings to the table defensively. What a package. The Cardinals, I believe, are going to be a very good defensive team. When you look at their corners, Tom Knight, Aeneas Williams, great cover guys. Now you get that quick pressure on the quarterback. It makes the secondary even better. Hard to believe that Andre Wadsworth was not recruited by anybody when he came out of high school in 1993 from an unrecruited walk-on who thought he had played his last football game when he played for Little Miami Christian High School. He thought the career was over all the way up to a number three pick in the NFL draft from walking on, gained a lot of weight, hung out with Peter Bulwer, who was his roommate, and Bulwer has challenged him to surpass Bulwer's rookie sack total of 11 and a half. Now, joining Grant Wistrom out of Nebraska, already taken in his first round, is Jason Peter. Peter was the roommate of uh, Wistrom at Nebraska. Those guys shared a townhouse and also shared the role of defensive leader. Peter and Wistrom at times able to scare their teammates into strong defensive play. And Peter, a guy who has put on a lot of weight like Wistrom since the end of the season. That's coming up. It's six. Excuse me, but if you dial 1-800-COLLECT... It's 10 cents a minute every evening. You know about 1-800-COLLECT super low rates, too? Of course I do, silly. Do you believe in destiny? 1-800-COLLECT, 10 cents a minute every evening. A snowflake falls at the far end of history. And that snowflake, we'll call him Steve, winds up as part of a droplet of water. And one day, that droplet, Steve's droplet, could wind up in a brewery where a man you'll never meet discovers the perfect temperature to frost brewed beer. And like that, Steve is in a Coors Light can, and then a tray, and a cup. And now, he's here with you. So I ask you, gentle stranger, do not spill, Steve. Coors Light! between the USA and Canada than any other airline. Why is America on America Online? Email is really cool. We can shop. It puts the whole internet right at my fingertips. And we've spent over $500 million to more than triple capacity. 
you name it. Online, I've got it. America Online. So easy to use, no wonder it's number one. Boomer Esiason, the fourth selection of the Bengals. Well, uh, Boomer is on the phone with us right now. And first of all, Boomer, I, I must say, uh, ever since you came on the scene, uh, you got to love the nickname. Been a fan of yours all the way. The Bengals really had the steal of the draft when they uh, got the three that they got, including myself. One thing I wanted to say, Boomer, I wouldn't, uh, I'd hang, I wouldn't hang my head now. I'd uh, keep my head high, just thinking back over the years. If you look back, which I mentioned earlier, at the quarterbacks who were very successful in the NFL. Very few of, of the quarterbacks who were successful went in the very early rounds. In no way am I hanging my head low. I'm very happy to be with an NFL franchise. Uh, it's sort of a motivational factor for me. And best of luck in whatever you do. I'd like to see you in the NFL this fall. Best of luck with the Bengals. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> oh, four scores, several hairs, and several chins ago. Nice hair, Mel. Boomer Esiason, Chris <laughs> Berman, Mel Kuyper. That was well, unbelievable. Well, Actually, you were still I playing at the I time, weren't you? I was still working, yeah. yeah. I, was working. And I would have enough connections here at this network to have burned that. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I'm, do I'm doing very good, actually, and uh, I feel good, and uh, it's been an interesting day, to say the least, with well, Randy Moss. And you, you, yes, it has. You look at your team, or well, you quarterback last year, and did they offer you another contract, by the way? Uh, the actually, they did, right, right prior to this, but uh, I knew that they were going to go linebacker. I I'm sure that they'll probably end up going defensive back or offensive tackle. I still think that they have a really good team. You know, last year at this time, the Bengals had very high hopes. When you look at what they're going into this year, however, they have nine playoff teams that they have to play. They have to play the NFC Central, the most, uh, uh, I guess, competitive uh, division in all of football, so they're going to have a very, very hard schedule. You have fond memories of this day? I mean, I mean, you've sat around for a while, but it, it worked out all right. You know, my, my memories were not fond, though, to be honest with you. No? Because, uh, you know, I thought I was going to be a top 10 pick, to be honest with you. And, and uh, I, you know, I dropped to number 38 or 37, I can't remember, and it was a bittersweet day for me. Um, you know, the difference then, though, was uh, we had the... Uh, you know, we had the USFL, and there were all the questions of whether or not I was going to sign a $40 million contract, much like Steve Young did, so a lot of teams were afraid of that. And I was dropping much like, you know, Randy Moss. I don't know, if, you know, obviously for probably different reasons, but I, I think... Probably. That, well, I, I think for the most... you worked for me. <laughs> that was, yeah, that's right, I did work you for you did at the work time. For me. I remember but, that. but it was a bittersweet day for me, but I certainly was very happy that I, that I got into the NFL. I did not want to go to the USFL, and I thought I made that plain and clear. But when Steve Young signed that big contract with uh, the LA Express at the time, I think it had definitely, definitely had an impact on me. Well, now you get uh, 14 years later a 40 million dollar contract with ABC. So yeah, just, right. So yeah. you see, if you sit around and <laughs> you know, wait, you get. Let me just say, this TV doesn't pay today. like the football does. <laughs> well, not yet. Right. Okay. Let, let's get caught up. You're going to join us for a while because the Bengals, of course, are on the uh, clock a few picks down. Carolina picked in a hurry while we were away. Jason Peter, because their run defense last year dreadful. They're trying to restructure their defensive line, and Jason Peter will be a key ingredient. You see 274, well, 292 during individual workouts, so his weight did fluctuate, but he can get off a block, plays through the double team. And remember, late this year, he had those back spasms, and played through that. He was at least on the field, trying to get on the field to play. Really set a great example for his teammates there. Hard nose, very relentless here on the sack. Uh, I think you look at Jason Peter, he also, because of that size situation, now 292, and his quickness, which you see right there against Brock York, gives you the flexibility. He can play a, a defensive tackle spot, a nose tackle spot, a defensive tackle spot, and a 3-4 for Carolina, and it gives him a lot of flexibility if, in fact, his weight can remain in that 290 range. Well, Peter will be playing the Carolina Panthers' hope next to Sean Gilbert. And that deal has not yet been made because Washington and Carolina, frankly, got into a Hatfield and McCoy situation. Yep. Uh, so now it can be made after this draft. Not made yet, but Sean Gilbert signed a sheet, or will have, with Carolina. Let's go to Mark Malone with some information about Sean Gilbert and the Panthers. Mark? Well, Chris, I've talked to Dom Capers, and he said, in fact, as, as you mentioned the Sean Gilbert situation, they traded their 43rd pick for uh, the number one pick in 2000 from the Miami Dolphins. Now, that will allow them to give two number ones, one in 99 and one in 2000, to the Washington Redskins for Sean Gilbert. In fact, what will happen is that offer sheet will be signed probably sometime on Monday. Capers feels confident that uh, that's going to get done. They've done a lot of movement in the free agent market. They've had nine free agents signed, most of those on defense. Gilbert will make it 10, and now that they've got Jason Peter, a guy that can replace Craig and inside at the nose tackle, they really feel that they've got that defense back in order. Boomer? Hi, Mark. Thank you. We, uh, of course, that's one that we've been watching for, uh, for a couple of weeks. 
Sean Gilbert had as many tackles last year as Mel, Joe, and I combined. Uh, <laughs> when he plays, he's pretty good. I mean, remember, he was drafted first round very high in his second year, uh, year with the Rams when they were still in Los Angeles, and now that puts that back so he had double-figure sacks. So they really are getting a guy that hasn't sacked uh, very high figures in about four years. But... Is that a big gamble to get a player like this? He's still young, guys. I don't really think it's a gamble. I, I, what I think is I think it's a calculated risk, however, because he's been out of football for a year, going to be paying an awful lot of money for him, yep. and they're going to have to be giving up some draft picks for him. I mean, this, has got to, this player has got to produce. At least you know you're getting a, a known quantity, though. Well, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with you. No, you don't agree with anybody. Uh, well, no, I do, actually, <laughs> at time to time, I do. But I think, that, I think the year off doesn't really hurt him that much. I think that he's okay, he's rested. Any injuries, you know what it's like, a guy takes a year off, all of a sudden you feel rejuvenated, you feel energized. I think the money he's going to get is certainly going to energize him. Now you add Peters as another young defensive tackle. Carolina, all of a sudden, in one fell swoop, winds up solving their interior problems, much like the Redskins did with Stubblefield and Wilkins. Well, I think it's great for him, you know, I, and certainly with the money that he's making, but I also think that, you know, they're mortgaging a, a pretty hefty future, uh, uh, you know, draft situation yep. for them. So, you know, this is, uh, they're going for the championship. That's what they want. Well, he's got a lot to prove. I think he has an athlete last year. Everybody kind of blamed Sean Gilbert and said, hey, if Sean Gilbert was in there, maybe the Washington Redskins are a playoff team. So I think when you look at Sean, he's coming in, he's fresh, maybe not rusty, who knows? We'll see. Uh, but he's certainly in that defense defensive structure. They were old last year. They had a lot of age up front, weren't very active. And now when you add a Jason Peter and a Sean Gilbert into the mix, it's got to upgrade that front seven. Let's go up to a guy that knows a little bit about defense, our, our Tom Jackson on, on Sean Gilbert after, uh, after shaking a little bit of the rust off. However, Seattle is on the clock. Are they about to make a pick? Is that what we're doing? We're going to go to Tom. <laughs> Somebody give me some help here. Seattle's pick will probably be Anthony Simmons, linebacker from Clemson. And as we go up to... Now, we're not going to go up to Tom. How about that? We're going to go to break. You know what? I saw <laughs> so three different covers. Like like two minutes to right play. <laughs> we're going to call a timeout. We'll be right back. The wrong nuts. I know. Starting this fall, the NFL on ESPN Radio. Five up to the minute stats and scores as they happen from around the league. Well, that's starting this fall. We've been doing that for years. Hear interviews from the stars that made the plays happen after it's over. NFL on ESPN Radio starting the first Sunday in September at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So if we have to call an audible on TV, you can go to ESPN Radio, basically. Seattle is on the clock. they got about a buck and a half to go. Let's go up to Green Bay and get some words of wisdom from our own Hank Goldberg on where Dennis Erickson and company are going. Hank? Well, I talked with uh, Dennis Boomer. Anthony Simmons, a linebacker from Clemson, is a guy he covets. Uh, outside linebacker, he thinks he can go inside. Remember, they picked up Darren Smith as a free agent and Chad Brown last year. That gave him a lot of speed at linebacker. Back to you, Boomer. <clears throat> All right, uh, Hank, thank you. Uh, the pick is up to the commissioner. And let's uh, zero in with uh, Paul Tagliabue. With the uh, 15th pick in the first round, the Seattle Seahawks select linebacker from Clemson, Anthony Simmons. You know, Mel, I mean, if we're scoring at home, um, it can be tough to beat the Swami. I mean, we've gone kind of right down the list here, haven't we? It's been we? very predictable, Chris. And I think if you look at Anthony Simmons, you see the eyes of a middle linebacker, a guy that really could play outside linebacker as well. And their system, he'll give a challenge, certainly Dean Wells, is coming off of a pretty good year. I think when you look at, at this kid, I think you see a guy very active, really one of the all-time leaders in tackles in ACC history, pursues, he's active, he's very alert, really like a cat. Every time you look up and you watch film, you study film, number 41 is on the scene big time. He's really all over the field. He's only about six feet tall, about 230 pounds, but tremendously instinctive, and a guy that, like I say, productivity in the ACC for his career was just unbelievable. Playmaker, playmaker, playmaker. Joe, let's plug him into Seattle. Well, Seattle's, Seattle defensively, I think, was very strong as it was. I mean, you take a look at the front. You got Sinclair, you got Adams, you got Cortez Kennedy. You pick up Sally Amua last year. Now you add this kind of speed to linebacker. All of a sudden, you've got yourself a defense that is as fast and as quick as anybody in football. I mean, Boomer, it's defensively is really where they've improved a lot in the last two years. Well, you know, I've always looked at Seattle kind of like an enigma. You know, they have all this talent there. They have one of the best all-time quarterbacks to come along. Uh, 
barring you, Joe, of course. But uh, Thank you. I will say this, that they have the talent to compete. There's no question about it. They're obviously in a very talented division with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Denver Broncos. And you never know what's going to happen with Oakland. And, and you would think that San Diego is going to give them a little trouble. But this team is a team they that I think... They slowly. Is, they always have a tough September. This is definitely a playoff caliber team in terms of their talent. Now, obviously, like, again, you have to look at their schedule. You have to look at who they're playing against. Is this the year, though? I, this will be a year that uh, they will definitely make the playoffs. Whether, whether they're Super Bowl caliber, you know, that's going to come down to Dennis Erickson and his coaching staff. Well, let me ask you this. They're, they really don't have a huge need area. They took Anthony Simmons. He'll be protected by those two big tackles. What are they missing to get to the next level? Well, to me, it, it, it comes all back to the coaching staff. You know, they have to get them ready to come out of the chute. And they got to be fired up as soon as the season starts. They cannot afford a slow start. You know who's going to be fired up? Game one, Ricky Waters. Game one at Philadelphia. Right. Well, that, that, that ought to fire them up right. a little bit Absolutely. to try and run the ball. Uh, Tennessee and then Cincinnati are our next two picks. Let's go to uh, Andrea Kramer in Jacksonville for some insight. Andrea. Well, Chris, I think that the talk in the, in the Oiler draft room is going something like this. The two players that they want are both there. Wide receiver Kevin Dyson from Utah, who Jeff Fisher said would be an immediate starter opposite Yancey Thigpen, and linebacker Brian Simmons from North Carolina, who Fisher said is a difference maker and would be better than any linebacker they currently have. But since both players they want are still there, they are also talking about trading down, talking to the five teams below them. If they believe that they can still get that player, remember Floyd Reese has traded down the past two years and got the guy that he wanted. Back to you, Boomer. <laughs> All right, Andrea, thank you very much. And now we have the Tennessee Tuxedos. And the reason we call them that is they're about to play in their third stadium in three years. Their deal with Vanderbilt is done. They'll play in their fourth stadium in four years next year in 99 when their permanent home in Nashville uh, is built and they're ready to go. Boomer Esiason, you know these Oilers team at 8-8, eight and eight, and certainly with Eddie George, they can dictate a little bit on offense. He's the real deal. They need to give Steve McNair as much help as possible. Is this the year that McNair takes off, or is he still a ways to go? What do you think? Well, you know, I think we've seen steady improvement from him, but it needs to take it up another level if this wants to be a playoff team. And they're close. They have a pretty good defense. Jeff Fisher always puts together a good defensive mm -hmm. team. I think Dyson's the guy here because of, uh, you know, he'll be a nice combination with Yancey Thigpen. You put Dyson in there, and now all of a sudden you have Eddie George. That's a pretty formidable uh, offensive firepower. Their wide receivers were the most disappointing part of that football team last year. They felt like McNair has reached a level to be able to play and be an efficient quarterback in, at still a very young age, but they didn't get the production near what they needed out of the wide receiving court. You've got Eddie George, so you're going to be able to control the running game. Now all of a sudden you need some place to be able to go down the field. That seems to be the the general theme of football teams that want to take it to the next level. Teams like the Oilers, like the Giants, that say, we have to now compete against Green Bay and Denver, the teams that can put points on the board. The only way they're going to do it is by throwing the ball down the field. And when I look at, when I look at teams like this, and, and I look at their young quarterbacks, now is the time that these young quarterbacks have to start playing to the level of their expectations. I mean, you know, these are first-round draft choices. I look at, uh, you know, what Steve did last year. He was 52%. He was about 2,600 passing yards, 14 TDs. You know, he's got the great scrambling ability, obviously has great athleticism. He had eight rushing TDs. He, he gave us fits when we played them last year in Tennessee, but then towards the end of the year, he didn't play very well for them. So this is the type of year that if this team wants to take it to the next level, you know, he's got to, you know, he's got to match the play in his division. And really, when you look at our division with uh, Brunel and Cordell Stewart, you know, that, th those are pretty, some uh, pretty high numbers that he has to match. Boomer, let, let me, let me, let me, and of course, we've talked about, you know, Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf. How tough will it be for them this year with all the expectations, or will it not be tough? If you're in their shoes, project how they'll do in year number one. Well, they'll definitely struggle. I would imagine that Peyton will start uh, the season out as long as he can get his contract mm -hmm. worked out. And, and the one thing that I keep hearing from these players is that they talk about the speed of the league. It's not so much the speed of the league. as when they see that playbook in front of them, and there's 350 pages in there that's not only describing their offense, but all the different defensive looks that they have to face during the season. I mean, it can be overwhelming. And the thing about it is, is that they have 20 hours during the week in college football to study for their game plans. In professional football, that's all you do. You know, you don't have any other books. That's you don't a day. Have any, right, it's a, it, yeah, it's a day in, in professional football. And just the amount of information that they have to absorb is monumental. And that's why quarterbacks have trouble. Down 20 points on the road. <laughs> Derek Thomas or someone, that, you know, right. with, the, with the smoke coming out of the, of the ears. 
They're going to handle it right eventually, though, but they're going to take some knocks. They'll handle it, you know, and I don't certainly don't want to rain on their parade. No, today. no. I, you know, I don't want to put, uh, you know, kind of take the smiles off their face. So I saw Peyton down and I said, hey, you know, congratulations, but yeah, well, well, where do you get the buffalo? <laughs> and it's like, Bruce Smith, and, yeah. and it's in December, and the wind is blowing, and there's 80,000 fans screaming and yelling, and you're down 21 to nothing, and it's third and 14, and number 78 is coming around the left side to your, your blind side. That's so when you long, find out what it's like. How long did it take you to feel comfortable in an NFL offense that you felt, I'm maximizing my talent in the National Football League? Well, I'll tell you, it was a lot better than the lights here. I'll tell you, you know, actually, we had a game like this in Cincinnati where the lights went out one night. You know, I was like, let's just take it in and call it a It's like a cereal well, commercial. You know, Mel, exactly. when Mel speaks, everyone listens. You can say, look at this silhouette of Mel. The Prince of Darkness, Mel Kuyper, will return. <laughs> leader in sports. This is ESPN News special presentation of the NFL Draft. Someone once said, let there be light. I think it was Mel back in 84 with all the hair. It's been answered. We have light and the light is now on the Tennessee tuxedos. The Oilers of Jeff Fisher on the clock. The card is going up. After that, we'll have Cincinnati's uh, second first-round pick, and then it's time for New England. And if Bo Boomer uh, talked about it. Dyson would certainly add up. He's the, he's the it really well. Boomer touched on McNair. Are you looking for some improvement there? You need the weapons. And Kevin Dyson, to me, a very underrated receiver. I thought he was a better all-around player than Randy Moss was during the course of the senior season, despite inconsistent play at the quarterback position at Utah. You look at the wide receivers with the Oilers. Of course, Big Pen, uh, 79 receptions with the Steelers coming over. Same division. Uh, Willie Day Sanders was really the disappointment. Did not step up and have the kind of year that they expected. Then the two young kids, Derek Mason and Joey Kent. Joey Kent really struggled as a rookie in the NFL. Now you look at Kevin Dyson. He was the number one receiver on my board. Randy Moss, too. Oz Hakeem, Jacquez Green, and Jerome Payton all in that early to mid-second round area. Although, don't be surprised if maybe a Jacquez Green slides up into the late first round. Well, he's an interesting player. There's no question about that. He's just 5'7", right? 5'8", five, five, eight eight and, eight and, yeah. eight and change. But he's an interesting, interesting player. As Tennessee mulls it over, they have four minutes to do it. They will continue to mull it over. They will send the card up to the... You know what? We had all the play... We had a 21 nothing lead until, <laughs> until you showed up. The moment the lights go, go out. The I'm getting... They're throwing, showing me defenses that See I what happens seen. when you have two quarterbacks? I mean, it just... It, it always something happens. Yeah, when the momentum's starting to go the other way now. I want to get back to his question. <laughs> Which was? Know, we'll I don't remember it, though. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start to see the light in the NFL is what I asked. Well, I'll tell you what happens. You know, with these young quarterbacks... You know what's going to happen with these young quarterbacks? Good they're going to see Joe and I doing this. They're going to think this is easy, too. <laughs> well, after, after about uh, 12, 14 years they can jump up here we'll be ready to, we may be ready to go in about two hours as a matter of fact all right now we're going to go around the league lots of things happening to get you caught up let's start with mark malone the young gentleman that will be manning the quarterback position for the colts will be peyton manning the indianapolis colts make him the first selection overall in the nfl draft their next selection will be the second in the second round number 32 look for them to take either a corner or a wide receiver now let's send it out to mike Golan. Here in Arizona, a couple of days ago, I talked to their top pick, Andre Wadsworth. He said he'd love to be a Cardinal because his college jersey number 58 was available. Well, he got his wish. He is a Cardinal. And as you see in the war room here, Vince Tobin handing out schedules for next year with Jake Plummer on the front. Maybe Andre Wadsworth will be the next picture on the front of their next year's schedule. Let's send it over to Chris Myers. Here in Dallas, the Cowboys had a chance to trade down, but with that eighth pick, they drafted defensive end, pass-rushing defensive end Greg Ellis out of North Carolina. The Tar Heels' all-time sack leader, Lawrence Taylor, remember, played at that school. What the Cowboys liked most about him was his character. His college coach, Mack Brown, said, hey, if I died tomorrow, I'd want this guy to adopt my kids. That's uh, Chan Gailey, not Charlie Chan, with number one owner Jerry Jones. We'll keep an eye on things in the war room. Now let's go to Andrea Kramer. Here in Jacksonville, the Jaguars fulfilled a need with the ninth pick by selecting running back Fred Taylor from Florida. They have a pick coming up at number 25 and they could be looking for defensive help, particularly cornerback. Tom Coughlin said he's a little surprised it's been so quiet with no trades. When I asked him why, he said, people are asking for the moon. Now let's go to Solomon Wilcox. Here in Cincinnati, the Bengals 
finished last season near the bottom of the league in at least six defensive categories. So they come out and use their first pick to take linebacker to Keo Spikes from Auburn. They had hoped to see Aaron Simmons, I should say Anthony Simmons on the board, but he is now gone. So they will turn their attention to Brian Simmons, the linebacker from North Carolina, or the cornerback Terry Fair from Tennessee. Now let's send it out to Sal Palantonio. Here in New England, the Patriots have two picks coming up, number 18 and number 22. And offensive coordinator Ordi Zampisi has got to be pushing offense. But the next candidate on the board, Robert Edwards of Georgia, the running back, could be the heir apparent to Curtis Martin. We'll have to wait and see. Now let's go to Chris Mortensen. Jimmy Johnson said Friday that he didn't think Randy Moss would for, fall to the Dolphins' 19th spot. So, he made a trade with the Green Bay Packers. He's gone from 19 to 29. Now, he obviously knew the Raiders are trying to trade up to get Randy Moss. But what happens if Moss goes to 29? Does Jimmy take him? Let's go to Hank Goldberg. I can't answer that either, Moore, but I know that in Green Bay, they're looking for deep defense with that 19th pick. However, with the rush of defensive players being selected, Ron Wolf, if the guy he wants isn't there, might trade back down to get extra picks. Let's go to Linda Cohn. In Charleston with Randy Moss, obviously the mood here is of disappointment, but there's positive uh, feelings in the room, and uh, there's a wait-and-see attitude, according to Moss's agent, uh, Abus Cook. Uh, again, the Raiders and Cowboys said to be working on something, but Buzz Cook hasn't heard from them within the hour. Back to you, Chris Berman in New York. All right, Linda and gang, Tennessee has made their selection. Let's head up to the commissioner. With the uh, 16th pick in the first round, the Tennessee Oilers select a wide receiver from Utah, Kevin Dyson. Kevin, we got to go with what? Tumbling Dyson? <laughs> <laughs> It's the Stokes. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. There you go. You're here in the senior bowl. This is against Roosevelt Blackman, cornerback from Morris Brown. It could be a second or third round pick, showing that ability and that deep speed. Uh, stop and go route. First out of his break, very similar to Marvin Harrison, who's a big fan of Kevin Dyson. Of course, that's been Marvin Harrison's forte in the NFL. Here's a punt returner. You see him flash that 4-4-5 speed, 200-pound frame, an angular wide receiver. And also, I think when you look at Kevin Dyson, the hand, the strong hand, instinctive receiver, can make the tough catch look routine and it's an inconsistency a quarterback at utah he adjusted to some poorly thrown balls did a heck of a job and late in his career chris his route running became a great deal more precise than it was early on is he a better receiver right now than randy moss i think so definitely i thought he was the number one receiver in this draft i like his size i like the angular frame the speed and what i like most about kevin dyson is the work ethic i love marvin harrison comes to play, he works hard in the offseason, he's got that burst out of his break, so he will separate from NFL corners, and I think for the Tennessee Oilers and Steve McNair's development, they're looking to accelerate that, he's a great fit. What a big year for your sports out of Utah, Majerus takes the team to the final game, and Dyson, a 16th, round, a 16th pick overall in the first round, what a big year it's been to Curtis Enos, and he's going to go to the Windy City, the Chicago Bears. He's with our Mike Tirico. Mike? Chris, thank you. And uh, his parents are going to come to Chicago and spend at least the rookie season with him. Uh, we were talking a little bit. You know the Bears situation. Raymond Harris, Edgar Bennett, Rashawn Salam. Somebody out of that mix probably won't be there. But still, they take a running back. Are you encouraged by that or discouraged about being stacked behind a position where there are some established guys? Well, I'm, I'm very encouraged by it. Number one, I'll be able to learn for some guys who's already played at the next level. And I think that knowledge is something my dad always told me, you know, always listen to somebody of older age because the knowledge, they've already been through a lot of things and hopefully those guys will be able to pass on that down to me. You know, and secondly, I think it's a, an excellent opportunity for me and my family to go to a place where there's been a, a great tradition of running backs and a great tradition of uh, National Football League football. Well, you talk about tradition in Penn State running backs. It hasn't been good of late. Kijana has struggled in the NFL. Blair Thomas, the Jet fans know about him here. How can you be different and learn from their experiences? Because I know you've talked to those guys. Well, I think that the one thing that I've said to, to a lot of people who's asked my questions is that, Mike, we're, we're all different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that God has blessed upon us all is how different we all are. And that's something that's made me the person who I am is that we've always been through some things. They've been through some misfortune. I've been through some misfortune. But, I mean, we're, we're different. And hopefully, you know, I, I can change the table. Hopefully, Kijana can do the same this year with the Bengals. Woo! 
quick last response with the whole incident with the awards ceremony and the jacket and making you ineligible for the bowl game. If that didn't happen, would you have come back for your last year at Penn State? No, sir, I was going to forego my senior year at Penn State and, and, uh, and, and take my game, take it to another level and just enjoy the things that, you know, what's happening today. Congratulations. He's looking Thank forward you. to his first Bulls game and his first day at the bleachers at Wrigley Field. Never, 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 never viewed it? All right, guys, thank you. You talk about Curtis Mike going to a team with some great lineage of running backs. Walter Payton, Gail Sayers, Greg Grange, Bronco Nagurski, Curtis Enos. I think he'll take his name on that list. Still to come, the Bengals and Wither Jeff Blake. New England, they've waited and Edwards is still there in the running box slot. And then Green Bay, do they stay, do they go? And Wither Randy Moss, we'll be back. We're back at the theater in New York. Uh, the Bengals have their second first round pick. They took Tequil Spikes, linebacker Auburn. Now four picks later. Here's a pick they got from Washington in the Big Daddy deal. Let's go up to the commissioner. With the 17th choice in the first round, the Cincinnati Bengals select linebacker from the University of North Carolina, Brian Simmons. Pamel, again, right down the middle of the fairway here. Well, it is, I'll tell you, they like Anthony Simmons and Brian Simmons. They already added to Keo Spikes uh, to Dick LeBeau's defense. And when you watch Brian Simmons here, number 41, another guy that really plays an all-around game. You don't have to take him off the field. He can get into the backfield, not as strong at the point as some linebackers are, not a dominating blitzer like others are, but when you watch Simmons, sideline to sideline, great pursuit skills, tremendous in pass coverage. That's what really separates him. His junior year and his senior year against Florida State, here against Thad Busby, he was an exceptional coverage linebacker. Dick LeBeau is not going to have to be concerned, Boomer, with a guy like Brian Simmons, even Takeo Spikes for that matter. Multi-dimensional linebackers in that 3-4 scheme. Well, that's what the 3-4 is all about. So it's a linebacker safety defense. That's why you know Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green, Rod Woodson, all these players mm -hmm. that make those types of big plays. And, you know, the Bengals obviously feel like the, the weak at the linebacker spot that they want inside and outside guys, the guys that can run, the guys that can make plays, and guys that are going to hit you right in the mouth when you get there. Well, let's go out to uh, Cincinnati. It's, it's Bengal time on, on, our, uh, on our draft show here from New York. Let's go out to Solomon Wilcox in Cincinnati. Solomon. Yeah, Chris. The Bengals are making a run on defensive players here in the first round. Right now, I'm joined by Bengals head coach Bruce Goslin. Coach, you're getting the guys you want, trying to improve the defense. Well, we, we went into the draft with that in mind. You know, we just have to be able to get the opposing offenses off the field. We've uh, drafted two linebackers uh, that can run. They've been very productive as college players, and uh, they're both tough guys. And you get to Kale Spikes from Auburn on the inside. Brian Simmons, will he play outside one-two punch? Well, I think we'll probably uh, take a look at Brian. Now, he's played the stack backer position. He has uh, rocked to the outside and blitzed some, but I think we'll uh, wait until minicamp to decide that. A little bit more on Brian Simmons here. He's one of the best cover linebackers in the draft. You guys can use him all over the place. Exactly, and, you know, uh, you know that becomes important in today's football, Solly, because... Uh, um, you know, you want him to play three downs, and and Brian has the uh, he has the athletic ability to play on third down and cover those backs coming out of the backfield. Yeah, and we'll now go back to New York and bring in my former quarterback. Help me get a Super Bowl ring, I should say, the runner-up. Let's bring in Boomer Siasen right now. And Boomer, do you have a question for the old coach? You know, <laughs> when are you guys going to stop drafting defense, Bruce, and start drafting some offense out there? Well, Boomer, if you can remember, we scored 42 with you in the game last year, and that wasn't enough. <laughs> so I'm tired of that, so we're going to stop somebody somehow. All right. Well, listen, I wish you guys good luck, and, uh, and I miss you guys. Thanks, Boomer. We'll see you. Okay. I, I've heard longer huddles than that. Well, you know what? I talked to Bruce last night, you know, but I will tell you this, and, and one of the things that really worries me about Cincinnati this year is that they have all the offensive firepower they need, but again, you go back to their schedule. They have to play in Detroit. They have to play in Minnesota. They have Green Bay, Tampa Bay, Denver. All at home, along with Buffalo, they got to go to Oakland. They play Pittsburgh twice. I mean, you know, they play, uh, obviously, Jacksonville twice. Baltimore's a much improved team. And, of course, Tennessee. That's nine playoff games that they have. Mm -hmm. I think it will be easily the, the, the most difficult uh, schedule of the year. 
What will it take for Jeff Blake to get back to the form that we saw, not last season, but the, a year before that, in 96, when his passes went out of the TV screen when you're watching, but still landed in everybody's hands 50 yards down the field? It was interesting. When I got there last year, he was extremely, uh, uh, I would say, positive about all the things that he was able to accomplish the years before. you got to remember where he came from, you know? And I think he's going to be a better player without me being there. I mean, he was a 58% com uh, completion percentage guy last year, but Jeff has not, not been known for the completion percentage. He's been known for the big plays. Yes. And he and Carl Pickens has, have really developed a, a dynamic relationship. Jeff has just got to learn that he has Darnay Scott, he has David Dunn, he has Corey Dillon now healthy, and he has a very healthy offensive line. When Kevin Sargent came back at left tackle, and Corey Dillon emerged as a superstar running back in this league, things started to happen for us. And I was able to exploit those, those players as best I could, and hopefully he learned from that. The boomer of him, the boomer, the boomer of you. Of you. Now, even though he was boomer for, well, you know, on I'm TV. I'm both the boomers. Thanks for joining it's us. It's my pleasure, guys. Oh, is he leaving? million dollar contract for ABC. Good luck with it. All right, thanks. Oh, you're I leaving? I am leaving. You guys Why? are here for the rest. I Why are you leaving? I can't. Stay a while. Oh, Take the rest of the day off. You and Tonsil can have an even shorter conversation. Let's go up to the much-awaited vision with Tom Jackson. Bengals, two linebackers, Tommy. You've got to love it. Well, the Bengals certainly shored up their linebacking core. They got Takeo Spikes inside and Brian Simmons from North Carolina outside, and he'll be the strong side backer. He has that six foot three, 235 pound frame. He's able to, to get on to people and get off people. The first shot we're going to see here is great range by him. Realize that one of the guys he runs by right there is All American corner Trey Bly. Then watch him control the tight end here from outside. Tight end actually has the angle on him. He gets him stands him upright, finds the football, and then gets rid of him. I think that that is probably the most difficult position to play in football is the strong side linebacker. I tried it for one year and couldn't quite make it. As we see Jack get down here, Jack McKiernan, the center from Rutgers, and he's not going to hurt me, but Jack's going to try to hook me as a tight end. I try to get control of him right here. The most difficult thing in football is to control a player for those three steps before you get rid of him. Brian Simmons is a pretty good guy at it and certainly going to build around Dick LeBeau's system. All right, Tommy, thank you. And you know what we got to say? We thank Jack for helping us out today. He's in Mel's book. Mel's book, the Bible has everybody. Even let there be light in Mel's book. The New England War Room. The Patriots are now on the board. If they want Robert Edwards, the running back, he's right there far. We'll be back. With the uh, seventh pick in the first round, the New England Patriots select Terry Glenn, wide receiver, Ohio State. Everybody has their own opinion, but the organization picks the player. Terry Glenn's selection of the 96 draft put Bill Parcells and owner Bob Kraft at odds. But the friction didn't affect the tuna's coaching style or the success of the Patriots. Led his team to the AFC Championship before losing in the ultimate game to the Super Bowl to the Green Bay Packers. But the animosity was boiling over. They want you to cook the dinner. At least they ought to let you shop for some of the groceries. So the Pats did their own shop and got Pete Carroll. Uh, I just think it's an ideal situation. Parcells took the Jets job and in week two met up with his old team in Foxborough. The Jets ended up losing a nail biter in OT. Parcells was able to land one of the Patriots' biggest fish. Coach Parcells is a, a coach that I enjoy playing with. I, I see uh, the New York Jets as a team of uh, great growth. Well, as a result of Curtis Martin, re Martin rejoining his old coach, Bill Parcells in New York, the Jets are on the sundial for a while. They will sit as New England grabs this pick, the 18th pick, which was one of two draft choices that they got uh, because of the signing of Curtis Martin. They got a one and a three. They have six of the first 83 because they have the Jets' second round pick. That's part of the Bill Parcells deal negotiated between the two teams at Commissioner Tagliabue a year ago. The Jets, another story, have recouped its two, but so the Patriots have two ones, two twos, two threes. It's like a Lawrence Welk in double. And now let's go up to Sal Palantonio in New England. Sal? Boomer, I just talked to the Patriots' war room. They are overjoyed that Robert Edwards is still sitting there at number 18. They gambled by not going up and trying to get Curtis Enos or Fred Taylor, holding on to these picks that they've gotten for Curtis Martin and Bill Parcells. They've got a player there that they want. 
and I do believe that they're going to take Robert Edwards to be the heir apparent to Curtis Martin, Boomer. Now back to you. All right, Sal, thank you. So we, we discussed that they gambled and won by staying where they are because we didn't think any running backs would go below Taylor. Once the Taylor went to Jacksonville, New England stayed put, and they're going to get their man, Robert Edwards, if that's where they want to go. Well, 217-pound running back, Robert Edwards is, Chris. And I think when you look at durability question, that's why he's still there, or he may have been a top-ten pick. Uh, you know, kid, strong runner, very elusive for a big back. He has a little bit of change of direction ability, but what he can do is hit the home run. And with the zone blitz packages, you see a lot of running backs going 65, 70 yards for touchdowns. Robert Edwards did that on a regular basis at Georgia against tough competition in the SEC. You see here, going the distance, taking it into the end zone. I think this is something that he provides for a 217-pound running back. He can catch the football, help him blitz pick up in terms of uh, blocking. I'll tell you what. When you look at this kid and you see time after time, and this highlight package is really accurate in terms of the way he played when he was healthy. Against Tennessee, he would have maybe had 300-plus yards had he not gotten hurt in that particular game two years ago. And he's a talent. What he has to do is prove, just like Robert Smith did coming out of Ohio State, that he's durable enough to play 16 games in the NFL. Well, there's some decent lineage, Mel, out of Georgia. Uh, certainly Terrell Davis, MVP of the Super Bowl in his hometown, and, boy, a six-round pick. I mean, that might go down as all-time as one of the classic lower draft picks in the history of the NFL. Uh, Garrison Hurst now coming into his own, although a couple of teams later, not Arizona or Cincy, but a very good player now for San Francisco. Rodney Hampton was a, was a key cog for the Giants, although he'll probably be playing elsewhere next year. And of course, Herschel Walker. So how about them dogs? They hope that uh, Robert Edwards, you know, can continue the Georgia lineage. The pick is now in. Let's go up to the commissioner. See if New England gets their back. With the 18th pick in the first round, the uh, New England Patriots select running back from the University of Georgia, Robert Edwards. Well, there are Patriot fans here as well as Jet fans are holding up signs. Bill, thanks for the picks. Well, they got their back. They got their back, but also they had Cedric Saw last year. So, I mean, they've got two very young backs. Derek Cullors also there as a running back. This is a football team that is pretty set in most places. What they're doing now is they're stockpiling and building for the future. That's why New England doesn't want to get rid of a lot of their picks. They didn't want to give up the house to move all the way up to Enos. If you look at Edwards and Enos, you can almost look at Manning and Leaf. You know what you're getting with Enos, you know what you're getting with Manning. With Edwards, if he stays healthy, there could be a greater upside as there is with Ryan Leaf. So you've got a similar situation in the running back uh, part of this draft that you do in the quarterback part of it. A little bit of the unknown in this guy. Yeah, but if, if the unknown becomes known, the Patriots uh, exactly. are certainly a serious contender to get back and represent the AFC in the Super Bowl. When we return, the Heisman Trophy winner, now a Raider. Charles Woodson will talk with our Mike Tirico and a draft update. Please stay tuned. Wide leader in sports. This is ESPN News special presentation of the NFL Draft. A quick update from our ESPN studios. Green Bay Packers on the clock with pick number 19 of the first round. This is a pick they got courtesy of a trade earlier today with the Miami Dolphins. Miami also picking up the Packers' second round pick. That means the wait will continue a little bit longer for Randy Moss. Jimmy Johnson, a coach who might have gone with Moss in this slot, and said he trades out. So Randy continues to wait as the names of other players are clicked off. We've already heard his coaches and teammates defend him. We've also heard some NFL coaches express their reservations. Those summed up earlier today by our Mike Godfrey. He has a high upside. I mean high. <laughs> he has a downside as big as the Grand Canyon. With the uh, fifth pick in the draft, Chicago Bears select running back Penn State University Curtis Enos. The Rams select defensive end Nebraska Grant Wistrom. New Orleans Saints select tackle San Diego State University, Kyle Turley. I just uh, got off the phone with the uh, Cowboys war room, and they're, they're going to go a cold feet like a number of teams are with the Randy Moss. What is interesting here, guys, is that he could go with this pick, or he could fall all the way to early second. The Dallas Cowboys select mm. defensive end from North Carolina, Greg Ellis. 
one team for whom Randy Moss might be in the picture, who are they are considering Ross, uh, Moss, although they don't necessarily think he'll be there at number 21, are the Minnesota Vikings. Dennis Green told me this is America. Everyone deserves a second chance. But perhaps even more interestingly, they have someone on their team they think would be a very good influence on Moss, his brother, Eric. Well, the Vikings may be surprised after all. Pick number 21, just a couple of picks away. It's the Packers and then the Lions. So we'll have to see, in fact, if Minnesota does take Randy Moss. In the meantime, the Moss camp waiting patiently or perhaps not so patiently in Charleston, West Virginia, where Linda Cohn is standing by. Linda? Oh, Chris, they're patient, all right. Randy's smiling, munching on chicken wings, remaining relaxed. Meanwhile, his agent, Buzz Cook, who also represents Brett Favre, of course, with Green Bay, moments ago got off the phone with the Packers, who said they're definitely not interested in Randy Moss uh, because simply they have too many receivers. Their concentration is on defense. But about the Vikings, Buzz Cook had a nice conversation this morning with Dennis Green. Dennis Green had contacted Buzz, talked about the possibility of taking Randy. Uh, Green didn't think Randy would be available when it was uh, uh, Green's turn to pick at 21, but it looks like he will be available at that spot. So uh, Dennis Green said he might be re-evaluating things when he had that conversation with Buzz Cook uh, this morning. And Chris Myers, is there a pers uh, uh, possibility? Yeah, Actually, yes, we're going to... Go there ahead, is, Chris. Linda. I was going to say there is that possibility. I just got off the phone with one of the uh, Viking assistant coaches who is making an argument, one of the offensive coaches who said he's rated as one of the top five offensive players in the draft. Vikings hoping to learn from history. In 95, they wanted Warren Sapp. Tony Dungy was pounding on the table. They passed on him, regretted that later. Chris Carter, they think, can be a positive influence. The Vikings are considering Randy Moss, even though their priority is a cornerback. Right now, let's go back to Chris Berman in New York. All right, Chris, uh, thank you very much. The Packers traded up. We'll, we'll talk about what they've done and what they were hoping to accomplish in a moment. Um, Gene Washington is going to make this pick. Not make the pick, but announce it. The Green Bay Packers have selected defensive tackle from yep. North Carolina, Vonnie Holiday. Yeah, that, that's... Well, you heard Hank allude to it earlier, and I'm on board with it, too, that they made the move up to 19, Mel. Well, we'll talk about Holiday. Who can he play defensive end? That's the big question for the. Packers. I think he can. He had a 33 vertical. He did the, uh, the 225. He bench pressed 31 times. He's very quick off the ball. You watch him here, and I tell you, this kid really gets into the backfield. He explodes. Like I said, 31 reps. He played in more of a read, react, contain defense at North Carolina. Gap responsibilities. Then he went after the football. You turn him loose at a defensive end spot at 295 pounds with his quickness and as active and alert as he is. This kid may plays at North Carolina on a regular basis. I, I think, you know, he's a projection. We project the, you know, corners to safety. You project defensive ends, outside linebacker. I think he can play that spot for the Packers because he's number one, he's so athletic and he's strong. And I tell you, you, t you let him pin his ears back and get after the quarterback, something he really wasn't allowed to do at North Carolina. And I think they got the best value in Bonnie Holiday on the board at this point. Well, that was not necessarily the guy they were looking at, but they, here's why they went with it. Here's the trade, by the way, which happened this morning about an hour before the draft began. Uh, the Dolphins and the Packers traded, swapped number one pick, so Miami will pick later on. And uh, the Packers' second-round pick went to Miami late in the second round, number 60 overall. Here's what's facing the Packers, and you got to remember that even though they've lost six players due to free agency, uh, they feel that their young guys, for example, Newsom was hurt last year and now will play corner the spot that Doug Evans occupied, and they feel that their secondary with Darren Sharper stepping in for Eugene Robinson, who unexpectedly was signed away by Atlanta. They can line up right now as defending NFC champs. What they saw in the Super Bowl was a winded, heated, uh, defensive line, we all saw it. They were worn down by the Broncos, and they lose defensive end Gabe Wilkins. And there's a big question. I don't know if Reggie White's going to play any more football. That hasn't been decided yet. I don't think he's going to. So they need defensive end help, and that's where Holiday fits right in. Because remember, this is a team that wants to get back to the Super Bowl, so they want to get a guy in that will start right now. Well, there's always the possibility. You've got flexibility. I think you've got a little flexibility with Santana Dotson. He is such a great competitor and a terrific defensive lineman in spots the way Fritz Shermer likes to move things around on defense. You could possibly move him outside. And don't forget, Fritz Shermer is the master of massive types of defenses from five twos to two fives to three fours. You could see a little bit more three four out of the Green Bay Packers also 
which would solve that problem. Well, Joe and Chris, I thought, you know, when you look at Vonnie Holiday, it wouldn't have shocked me back a month, two months ago if the St. Louis Rams took him at six. I thought he was one of the top ten players in this draft. I thought he was on a, a par with Wistrom. I think when you look at the Green Bay Packers, how he fits in, I think, you know, he's a heck of a pick. Moving up, you're not going to get him if you remain where you are if you're the Green Bay Packers. You get that versatility. I think it, it, this is a choice that for John Dorsey and for Ron Wolf. They did a heck of a job. It's, you, you wonder why teams are in Super Bowls, because they make good moves. And whether the right player slid or not, Bonnie Holiday was not going to be there late in the first round. So they will have a holiday in Green Bay after this draft, <laughs> right? Well, they're having a holiday in uh, Oakland because, once again, a Heisman Trophy winner will wear the silver and black like Plunkett and Marcus and Bo and Timmy Brown and Desmond Howard. And now it's Charles Woodson. On his way to Oakland, he's with our Mike Tirico. Michael. Yep, just like Desmond trades in the maize and blue for the silver and black, there were some media reports about attitude questions from teams with you because you left the combine a little bit early and some workouts a little bit early. Did you hear any of those questions from teams? No, none of the teams brought, brought any of that stuff up. I mean, it was just stuff that was brought up in the media. It was basically, all of it was untrue. I mean, I'm, I'm not a bad person. I don't have a bad attitude. I just want to get in and play hard and play good football, and that's it. You have a DB's attitude, which is aggressive, and the Raiders can use that. We're going to show everyone where the Raiders stacked up statistically on defense last year. It was 30th all the way across the board in the three positions you don't want. Yards, yards passing yards receiving you were out there and met with some of the defensive coaches what was their impressions of how you could fit into their scheme well i think basically you know they just want to get me in there and just teach me the system they just got a uh, willie shaw out there he's a good defensive coordinator out there and, uh, he does a lot of the things that we did at michigan so hopefully i get out there and uh, just, just make an impact and hopefully get some early playing time finally you know the one thing we all did watching michigan games we wanted to see where you were going to go were you going to line up on offense Will you line up on offense? And have you talked to the Raiders about that at all? We talked about it briefly. But like I say, I just want to get the defense down. And uh, hopefully if the offense stems for that, then I'll go over there on that side of the ball and uh, get a couple of touches on the football. Was Al Davis as cool as you thought he'd be? Oh, he was too cool. He was too <laughs> cool for me, man. Congratulations, Charles. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Charles Woodson from Michigan to the Raiders. We send it to our ESPN studios and Chris Fowler. Chris? Well, Mike, thank you. I think Charles making a key point. None of the team's concerned about his attitude, which has been the report of, or the subject of media reports. Part of it got started at a Walter Camp Football Foundation dinner that, that I emceed. One of the former officers of that club kind of popped off to a small Connecticut newspaper about his displeasure with Woodson's attitude, and suddenly this became a monster national news story. I can tell you, I know Charles pretty well. Most of that stuff is unfounded. I think an NFL team that gets him into camp will find a guy, as he said, that's just eager to play good football, is respectful, is a team guy. And I'll tell you what, the coaches that watched him at Michigan, the first day of practice, put him as a converted running back in high school to defensive back, and Vance Bedford, his position coach, remembers thinking at the time, this guy is a terrible corner. This guy will never make it as a defensive back. Here he is, Heisman Trophy winner, and now the number four pick overall. The Detroit Lions are on the clock in the first round as the NFL draft continues after this from New York, Connecticut, and all points. We are back in New York. Detroit is on the clock, and I, I gotta guess it's safety Sean Williams. I mean, I, I mean, we're going right down the the uh, the Bill Wall scripted plays that's happened today, and Let's go up to Gene Washington and see how we do. The Detroit Lions have selected defensive back from Tennessee, no. Terry Thayer. Mm, a little different. A little different. Now, they had such great success last year, drafting one and two and got two starting corners, of course, in Westbrook and Abrams. Well, I'll tell you, you look at five, nine and a quarter, Chris. That's the concern. But you see his ability to play the ball. Interception here, real good hands for the INT. And I think when you look here against Florida in some big games, he makes plays there against Jacquez Green. I think when you look at Terry Fair, he was challenged on a regular basis in the NSC for the most part. Did a pretty good job. A lot of pass breakups in the SEC, interception. You know, I tell you, he breaks on the ball well. You know, five nine and a quarter is a concern. Remember, they had Kevin Abrams last year uh, coming in as a second round pick. He may end up being the nickel back. They had Bryant Westbrook. They hit the jackpot with him. He's a great starting cornerback. But you know, Terry Fair is a gamble because, like I say, he's five nine and a quarter. And you look at some of those wideouts that you're matched up against in the AS in the NFC Central. Uh, you know, you look at the, at this and you say, okay, if Abrams wasn't big enough, now you go to another five nine and a quarter corner. We'll see what happens. Let's uh, move back a little bit before we discuss fair a little bit more. Let's uh, stay in the division and go back to Green Bay, who moved up 10 spots and got Bonnie Holiday. Our Ron Wolf is with our uh, Hank Goldberg. Hammer. 
Okay, Boomer and Ron Wolf, General Manager, Executive Vice President of the Packers. Uh, I know when you traded up, you had your eye on somebody, and then somebody else became available. You want to tell us what happened? What, what happened was we, we knew that in order to, uh, to get the players that we needed, we had to add something to our defensive unit. We knew sitting at, or I shouldn't say we knew, but we certainly felt at 29 that we wouldn't be able to do that. So we rehashed it over and over again about the, what would be the possibilities of moving up, where could we move. Uh, Jimmy Johnson's always very receptive, and uh, fortunately we caught him at a good time uh, because we had to add defense. We were looking at two players. I think you alluded uh, uh, to Sean Williams. Certainly UCLA was one, and we never expected, uh, and everybody says this, that everybody drafts, so we never expected the guy we took to be there, but that's the honest to God truth. Uh, uh, we're just delighted. It's certainly an area we need help. Uh, we feel Vonnie can play end or tackle. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, where he fits, but he will fit with uh, the, our present situation on the defensive line, no question. All right, Ron. Thanks very much. We go back to New York for another pick. Boomer? All right, Hank and Ron Wolf, thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, Minnesota is in as we have a run of the, of the uh, NFC Central Division teams. Here's Dean Washington. The Minnesota Vikings have selected wide receiver from Marshall University, Randy Moss. There you go. Carter, Jake Reed, Randy Moss, a healthy Brad Johnson, Big. Robert Smith signed, McDaniel and Stussy signed up front. His brother Eric Moss yep. in Minnesota. So I think you look at Randy, you see the size, uh, physical ability, athletic ability is, is tremendous. Uh, you watch him here against Ole Miss, and this is the first play, offensive play for Marshall, touchdown. That's the capability he, br he brings to the table. Tremendous speed. I tell you, he can just explode on deep routes. You watch him here. Look at the athleticism coming up here. I mean, you're talking about a guy, look at that. I mean, you don't see that in receivers that come into the NFL draft out of the college ranks every year. Now, granted, he dominated a lower-level competition. You see him here, fade route. He's unstoppable uh, in the Mid-American Conference in that particular area. Uh, you know, catching the ball right off the defender's helmet. Uh, yeah, you look at this, a man among boys at that level. The question with Randy is, against West Virginia, and of course, in that old Miss game, after he hit the uh, home run early, struggled a little bit, getting off the line of scrimmage, route running's just a little floppy. He needs to fine-tune his game a little bit. Obviously, the off-the-field concerns are there. He has to put all that to rest, stay focused on football, work on his game at wide receiver. I spoke to Andre Wadsworth about him. Of course, they were together that one year. And he said one thing about Randy Moss that impressed Andre was he was in the weight room and he was working to develop his skills that one year he was at Florida State as a redshirt. So if he stays focused, sky's the limit for a kid with his physical and athletic ability. Hey, offensive weapons in Minnesota, Joe. We just exactly. mentioned them here. I mean, let's take a look. If you if you see a big grin in Minnesota, it's Brian Billix, the offensive coordinator. He's got to be grinning ear to ear. Andrew Glover at tight end, all these wide receivers. You look at the receptions. Chris Carter with 89, Jake Reed with 68. Chris Walsh with just 11, and Hatchet with just three. But now you bring in a Randy Moss. You go three wide, you've got the three biggest receivers in a division where they like to throw the football anyway. I think the one thing that Randy Moss brings now to the Minnesota Vikings is he brings a real deep threat down the field. You, you look at Carter, you look at Reed, both of them big guys, both of them mid-range big receivers. Now you've got somebody who adds a stretch to the field. You start stretching the field out with him, you can do an awful lot with those big guys underneath. So, and, and I also think we talked about this if he'd gone to Dallas. Very positive influences around him. We talked about a Michael Irvin. I believe can be a positive influence and a Deion Sanders. Now you look at Reed and Carter and the guys that have been put together on that Minnesota Viking football team. You've got a very good, positive group for him to be around. I go back to the Detroit Lions. Terry Fair, 5'9 and a quarter, has to match up against a Reed, a Carr, and now a Moss in a division where you have Abrams and other small corners. Yeah, but I, I still think, I think quickness can negate size. Like I said, you can't be perfect with the ball. Guys can get in front pretty good. Well, 5'9 and a quarter, cornerback, covering against Randy Moss five. and Jake Reed and Chris Carter. He, good luck, Joe. He better be able to run at least, right? <laughs> One of our quarterbacks, and, and we have a lot of quarterbacks, who, who play with a, with a guy even taller and more angular than, than Randy Moss. I'm talking about Harold Carmichael. Let's go up to Ron Jaworski. And, Jaws, how does Moss fit in with Minnesota? Obviously, they can push the envelope through the air. Yeah, Boomer, from uh, an athletic standpoint, it's a great fit because he's got the size in the red zone to go up and get the football. He's got the size and the speed to come across in the red zone and catch the, the delay routes underneath and run him in the end zone with his great ability. 
But where I see a problem, he's kind of a freelance route runner. He likes to do things on his own. And as Joe mentioned a moment ago, Brian Billick likes that disciplined timing and rhythm passing game where the quarterback sets it three steps, delivers the ball in two seconds, or excuse me, 1.5 seconds, and the receiver runs out. And I'm not sure Randy Moss is the kind of guy that's going to assimilate all those little nuances of a timing and rhythm passing game quickly. But he certainly has the ability to do so. And I'll tell you, three wide, when you look at that, they got some real talent, Boomer. It'll be interesting, Jaws. It, it, it will be interesting to watch. And that team is one of the most fun teams to watch anyway. And then Brad Johnson got hurt late. And, and then they, you know, they, they are a, a, a team that, that will really contend next year, even though there are four playoff teams from the NFC Central. Let's go out now to West Virginia to Linda Cohn, who is with Randy Moss. Linda. Chris. His mother says it's fulfilling a lifelong dream for him. Randy Moss playing along with his brother Eric, and it's going to be with the Minnesota Vikings. Congratulations, Randy. Uh, did you think it was going to take this long, though? No, I really didn't, but um, we all sat in the room looking at the TV, and uh, we just waited on the right call to be made. So uh, Coach Green made the right call, and I'm happy, and now I can just uh, be there with my brother. Minutes ago, you were talking with Dennis Green, and what did he have to say? What did he tell you? He just said, um, really, just to be encouraged and uh, just let all that <clears throat> stuff and hype just, uh, just still just keep it in the back and uh, let's just, you know, concentrate on what we're doing best and he's going to bring me in to play ball and that's what I'm going to do. Have you talked, have you had previous discussions with your brother about the Vikings or the possibility of joining him there? I don't think my brother expected me to be uh, late in this round, but um, I guess, you know, this uh, was made out for the best and uh, I'm just happy and very lucky. Randy, you told me yesterday that if you knew all this kind of talk about uh, all the negatives coming out, the weeks leading up to the draft, you told me if you knew all this was going to happen, that maybe you would, you know, have thought differently about coming out after your sophomore year at Marshall, and you might have considered staying another year. Uh, yeah, like I told you yesterday, I think uh, the past had a lot to do with it, but uh, I'm picked now. I'm a Viking now, so uh, I'm very high, happy and excited to... Uh, be going there with my brother and Coach Green in Minnesota with the receiving court and quarterback and running back that they have. So hopefully I can fit in and uh, just make it happen. You also told me that uh, you have something to prove, especially to the teams that passed you by. Does that still hold true? I'm not really holding a grudge, but I think with the kind of excitement I bring to a football uh, game or team, uh, they uh, passed me up. So I don't really, like I said, don't hold no grudges. I'm just happy now that I'm a Viking. So I'm just going to make the best stuff to go in there and just hopefully uh, fulfill my dream, and that's to play and win games. Do you feel you have anything to work on at the next level? I think just listening to all the analysts, uh, they really said a lot, and I took it in my head, and uh, they made a point, you know, these certain things that this guy has to work on to be successful in the league. So uh, I'm just taking it uh, beyond you know, to another level and uh, just do what they said and hopefully turn out to be the best. You had a reputation of teaching young receivers at Marshall University. Some of the things you learned in your one year at Florida State, are you going to welcome that from the veteran receivers like a Chris Carter and such at the Minnesota Vikings? Almost definitely. Uh, seeing Chris and uh, Jake Reed down there doing uh, the things they do best, that score touchdowns, and I think I was looking at the receptions uh, for the whole year, and uh, hopefully I could just fit in to, to their mix and uh, like I said, just make it happy. I think I'm about winning championships, and I just want to come to Minnesota and hopefully uh, put them back in the, the game. Randy, thanks for your time, and congratulations. Right. Randy Moss, a new member of the Minnesota Vikings. All right, Linda, congratulations to Randy. We know now the Minnesota Vikings are no Rolling Stones because Rolling Stones don't gather no moss. <laughs> the Vikings have gathered Randy Moss, and when we return, we'll talk with Dennis Green on the, uh, the video conference phone. And New England is on the clock. So now the plot has thickened. We shall return. Like a rolling stone. <laughs> Because you know, you know how many times they've tried to break from the door, of the 1998 NFL draft you know is brought to you by AC Delco Automotive Parts. AC Delco. If you're not asking for it, you're asking for it. And by Taco Bell. Want some? Now, welcome back to New York, and so uh, one of the more intriguing songs of the first round and now has an ending. And we presume it's a happy ending with the Brothers Moss now playing for Coach Dennis Green in Minnesota. Randy Moss, the Vikings, first round pick, the 21st overall. And joining us now on the sprint to video teleconferencing is Coach Dennis Green. And uh, uh, Dennis, uh, first of all, congratulations on the pick. As usual, you're never afraid to stick your neck out, right? Never afraid. Um, well, the bottom line... 
When did you think well, that Randy say this. Moss would come to you? Uh, probably last November, because oh, I okay. think in the National Football League, well, let's face it, I mean, this is old, old news. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not like it happened yesterday, right. and that's been our philosophy. We'll take the best player on the board. So last November, I thought it could be, regardless of whether we're picking 30 or further down, that uh, we could get the player. Dennis, how much in knowing his brother and having him play for you, did that play a role, a huge role in, in you making this pick this way? Well, we know more about uh, Randy Moss mm -hmm. than anybody else. We have his brother here. We spent a lot of time talking to him. We've got probably the best spiritual leader in the National Football League and Reverend Keith Johnson, who's the head of cause. We've got one of the best players, Chris Carter, in the National Football League as far as working and trying to get guys to understand what it takes to be uh, true to yourself and understand yourself. So. We have no doubts about Randy Moss. What we think is this. Randy Moss teaming up with Chris Carter and Jake Reed, with Robert Smith in the backfield running the football, and Andrew Glover going down the middle will give us the most potent offense in the National Football League. And that's why we drafted him. Will there be, and I know you just drafted him, Dennis, so I mean, you don't have the answer <laughs> to the question yet, but will there be special provisions in his contract, including maybe drug testing that maybe you're not in other players' contract? Is that part of an, of, a, of an agreement? I mean, you've talked with him before, obviously. No. No. That, why would it be? Everybody in the National Football League has drug testing. But that's I mean, I think this. I, you know, when I go back to this, it's plain and simple. This is a young man who's a great player who made some mistakes in his past. He was 18 and 19 years old. He's still only a 21-year-old young man. And we think this, that his life is ahead of him. We're taking the high road. We're saying we got a full glass of water here, and we got a football player who's going to mean a lot to our football team to help us win a championship. Hey, you know what I hear in your voice? You know, we just visited a couple of weeks ago. I hear and I see excitement. I mean, you're excited about this, about going to re redo the playbook, right? Well, I am simply because what we have now and what we haven't had in a few years is a big receiver that can go on the outside opposite of Jake Reed with now Chris Carter working real big time on the inside. And so with that in combination with Robert Smith, we're going to be there. Dennis, this is Joe. Does it also give you that opportunity to take the ball down the field a little bit more? Chris and Jake, they're, they're fast, but certainly not in this type of a category. Sure. It really can stretch the field for you, can it? Well, I, th I think it can. You know, we've had so much trouble with Herman Moore throughout the years, and Herman runs a hitch and a hook and a go. I mean, Randy Moss can do a lot of things besides just a hitch, a hook, and a go, but that is sufficient when you talk about what Chris Carter can do on the inside and Jake Reed on the outside. And again, with Rob, let's put in the kind of money with Robert Smith. It only makes sense for us to do everything we can to put the defense in a situation where they cannot defend the Minnesota Vikings. Dennis, this is Chris again. Now, you passed a couple of years ago on Warren Sapp, but every situation is different. And sure. there's a question with some about coachability uh, uh, of Randy Moss. You obviously, I'm guessing, don't feel that that's even an issue. Am I right? Well, it isn't. Well, we, we talked with Coach Bob Pruitt. He doesn't, he thinks he's a tremendously coachable young man. And I think this, we know a lot about him. We don't think that's going to be a problem at all. We have a lot of players on our team that have had to develop and come on. He does too. No rookie player is going to go out and, and be the MVP in the National Football League. But we know this, this is a great talent. And that's really what it comes down to. So we're not going to be concerned about that. We know what he's going to do. He's going to come in here and help make us a lot better. Hey, you see Warren Sapp uh, twice a season, and you see what sort of a player right. he has become, which isn't really a surprise. Did passing on him a couple of years ago maybe affect this decision at all? I mean, creep in and say, hey, we could have done that too? <laughs> Keep in mind, all Warren Sapp information came the day before the draft and the day of the draft. What we're talking about with Randy Moss, we've known about for two years. So I think that's right. the difference in night and day. You're excited. I can, I can, I can sense it. Go back, go back yeah, in there the and enjoy up. yourself. Tee the ball up. <laughs> tee it up. Now. All right. Uh, hey, hey, thanks for joining us, Dennis. We'll see you a little All later. All right. Take care now. You bet. I, I tell you what. Play now. They were, they were laying in the weeds on this one, weren't they? Well, they were laying in the weeds. Well, we'll talk about that. New England, the card is coming up. And is there a question as, is this a chance for a safety or a corner that really pushes the action like, Bucky to Bucky Jones? <laughs> we'll see. Let's go up to Gene Washington. The Patriots have selected defensive back from Syracuse to Bucky Jones. Lucky to Bucky from Tampa New Britain, Connecticut. About 
they're about three wood from our studios at, the, at ESPN, and he is a guy that can really play a Pete Carroll pressure type defensive backfield. Do you like the pick, or is this a reach? No, not at all, Chris. He was the number two cornerback on a lot of teams' boards. Of course, Charles Woodson, then to Bucky Jones. You say it's a projection. Is Jason Seahorn a pretty good corner now? Ronnie Lott, everybody said it was only a safety, was a corner early in his career and a phenomenal corner at that. You see 214, he's been as up as high as 217 during individual workouts. Still running 438. What you like about the Bucky, watch the athletic ability here. Now that's the ability to, to make up ground in a hurry for a safer corner that's going to come into uh, the focus in the NFL. Here's the touchdown return all the way. You're not going to catch the Bucky Jones with his 4.38 speed. This is against Tulane this year. First year in the defensive secondary. Another pass breakup. You can see the range in coverage. And I'll tell you, the guy made plays had, in his first game, Chris, as a defensive back this year against Wisconsin. He went out and had nine tackles. He's instinctive. He picks up things very quickly. He gives you a lot of versatility. He could be a free safety, strong safety, a cornerback. And obviously with New England, you have Ty Law, but you have Jimmy, Jimmy Hitchcock coming off kind of a struggling year. Rumor that he's on a trading block in New England. So Bucky Jones will be asked, I believe, this year to be a factor at cornerback. Remember also last year in the first round, they drafted Chris Canty out of Kansas State. Struggled a little bit his first season in the NFL. Size was a problem with Canty. Size is not a problem with the Bucky Jones. Aggressive guys in the secondary and really in the whole defense. I mean, that fits Pete Carroll. And they'll talk about it, Joe. We look at their secondary. Of course, they got big plays at the safety spot because, uh, you know, big play Willie Clay and right. Lawyer Malloy are very solid at the safety position. And also very young, Chris. When you take a look at this secondary, Ty Law just a couple years in the league, Lawyer Malloy the same way. Willie Clay, you know, he, he got his nickname, Big Big Play Clay, Chris Canny again last year added. The interceptions were not very high. I think what they can do is they can afford to go after people, cover a little bit closer. When you add it to Bucky Jones, now all of a sudden you're looking at a secondary that can play together for four, five, six years with the same people, and you've got some depth. So what Mr. Kraft and Pete Carroll are doing with the New England Patriots is they're adding quality and depth and guys who can contribute right away. That's the luxury position that the New England Patriots are in now, having the draft picks that they are. This secondary pick right here is going to, again, it's in a division where you have to have corners who can play. The unique thing about Tabucky Jones, a lot of people like to use three wides. He can be a good support safety type of a corner, which a lot of smaller guys can't do. A good family man. He's married. He has the children to take care of. I think his priorities are in order. I think when you look at Tabucky Jones, Marvin Harrison said it best. A great wide receiver already with the Indianapolis Colts. When you said, what's house Tabucky Jones? What do you expect? He said, when he comes to the NFL, he's going to be all business. He's well, going to be focused. He's going to be ready to work. He's a southern New England fellow living about two hours from where the Patriots are going to play in Foxborough. The 18th of April is a very famous day in New England lore, American lore, but certainly New England lore. Maybe Tabucky knows about it. 18th of April in 75 was Paul Revere's ride. Well, the 18th of April in 98, Tabucky Jones, Robert Edwards, guys that could push the envelope on either side of the ball. Just thought we'd give a little history lesson at some point in the first round of the NFL draft. <laughs> now let's go up and talk about Tabucky with uh, Chris Fowler and Coach Godfrey. Guys? Chris, you mentioned New Britain from New Britain to New England. Tabucky Jones, the guy who played running back at Syracuse until he finally convinced the coaching staff up there, I can be better used as a defensive back. Get me on the field. He was only getting five or six carries a game as a running back. Mike Godfrey, you're able to see him play on both sides of the football. As a, as a defensive back, what are his strengths? Well, he's got a lot of strengths, uh, Chris. When I talked to Bob Valiceni, who's the Green Bay Packer uh, secondary coach, he really liked him about a month ago, and he's a workout wonder. He's worked himself into this top draft position. You look at him, he has got great athleticism. He's only one year as a safety. Now, the pro defensive coordinators that I talked to him look, look at us as a possible corner position for him. They like his size versus big receivers. Has a quick burst. You see him come off the receiver right here. Now he closes ground. He causes the fumble. He has speed also, the running back speed that you talked about. He gets an interception. Now he turns into the running back skills of that great speed that he's done in these workouts. And he really is probably one of the best athletes in this draft. And when you look at him, I think there's a couple questions. One is, can he be a corner? And two, I think he can be a great special teams player for you. He's delighted to go anywhere. He'll be even more delighted, I think, to stay in New England. Uh, Mel mentioned he has kids. He has a seven-year-old daughter. So Tabucky tell me he's going to start shopping for schools as soon as he knows where he's going. Also got sons who are five and two years old. And now he's headed to New England along with another guy you like, Robert Edwards. Sal Palantonio with Patriot head coach Pete Carroll. Sal? Thanks, Chris. 
Pete, you got two guys that you really wanted, Robert Edwards and Ted Bucky Jones. Tell us about Robert Edwards. What did he impress about you? Well, we, uh, we liked a lot of things about him. He's a great all-around athlete, got great hands, and he's strong, and he runs tough. Uh, he can break the big play. Uh, we, we, we really like his attitude and, and his, uh, what, what he brings to our club, so we're real excited about that pick. Now, he had a foot injury a couple of years ago, an ankle injury. There are some critics out there who say maybe he's not durable enough to carry the load in the NFL. Are you worried about that at all? No, we, we investigated that thoroughly, and uh, you know, we think he's, he's fine now. He recovered that and you know, came back from it and played very well this year. So uh, he's very tough and pushed his, his recovery time as well, so we like that about him also. Tell us about Tabucky Jones. There was a recent contingent of the Patriots that went up there, worked him out. Uh, you like him. You like his size and speed. Safety or cornerback? It, he's a he's a rare player uh, for us to have an opportunity to pick uh, at this time. He's got tremendous, you know, physical skills, speed, size, and all of those things. Uh, but what I like best about him is, is uh, his attitude about contributing to his club any way he could. And he was a great special teams player. He scored touchdowns on defense. Uh, he, he's got a real supreme toughness that we love about him. And so uh, we're going to bring him in here, and, and I'm going to try to teach him everything I know about playing bump and run corner. And uh, we're going to make a corner out of him and see how that goes. And uh, we, we count on, we're going to count on that happening. Uh, we know he can play safety as well, and he's, and he's a very, very good special teams player. So we're real excited to bring him here. Hitchcock on the training block? Uh, no, not, not right at this time. We entertain offers? Well, there have been some phone calls on him uh, all throughout the offseason, so we'll, you know, we'll continue to take calls on whoever calls on our, about our players. Thanks very much, Pete. Good. Let's go back to Chris Fowler in Bristol. Sal, thanks. Patriots, two picks, two great athletes. What about a 220-pound corner with a 40-inch vertical jump and an attitude that will do anything to help improve the football team? Talking about to Bucky Jones. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, successful drafts in recent years. They are on the clock as round one continues after this. Polaroid presents the NFL Draft Snapshot. Oh, very surprised. Yeah, I, we thought for sure it would be either Indianapolis, Washington, or L.A. Indianapolis has selected uh, Trev Alberts, linebacker from Nebraska. But the pass off of Trent Dilfer, when all you have is Jim Harbaugh, give me a break. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper, in a way? I mean, here's a guy that criticizes everybody, whoever they take. Mel Kuyper has no more credentials to do what he's doing that my neighbor, and my neighbor's a postman. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have uh, made the sixth pick in the first round, and they've selected Trent Dilfer, quarterback, Fresno State. Well, Chris, I'll tell you, I'm secure in my position. Obviously, Bill Tobin is not very secure in his position to have a response like that. To me, it's a mistake. You cannot go with Jim Harbaugh and pass up Trent Dilfer. Forget it. That's why the Colts are the laughing stock of the league year in and year out. Trent Dilfer started only two games as an NFL rookie, but in 95, he was named Tampa Bay starter. However, struggling the next two seasons, throwing an NFL high 37 interceptions. Trev Alberts played three years in his injury plague Colts career. He started only seven games and retired last year. While Dilfer came into his own, guiding Tampa Bay to a 10 and six mark and their first playoff win in 18 years. Trent Dilfer was the first Bucs quarterback ever at a Pro Bowl. Who the hell is Mel Kuyper anyway? Well, we'll get back to that in a moment. We have our first on-the-board trade coming up with Tampa on the clock, and let's go up to the commissioner. I guess we get the commissioner out of dry dock when there's a trade, right? As uh, stated a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds ago, uh, Tampa Bay traded its pick to the Raiders, and the Raiders selected tackle from Florida, Mo Collins. Well, let me tell you what that was, okay? Let's, let's, let's. Well, we'll get you the rest of the trade in a moment. Um, I'm trying to listen. Well, we're gonna, we, Oakland has three second round picks, so we're, we're going we're gonna to get uh, this straight in a moment. But the Oakland Raiders have moved up to the 23rd spot and have taken Mo Collins, and I'll tell you what happened, because this is a Bay Area bombshell. San Francisco across the Bay has had their eyes on Mo Collins for weeks. He's now going to be playing in the Bay Area on the other team. 
Well, I'll tell you, you look at Mo Collins, I see a guy who really came on as a, as a junior. Remember, he had another year of eligibility left. I think the game that really defined him was certainly against Andre Wadsworth, but you watch me here at right tackle. Just a, a massive offensive tackle, a heck of a bookend, and a guy that I think, you know, when you look at him and project him into the NFL, should become a much better run blocker than he was at Florida. But certainly, that game against Andre Wadsworth, Chris, late in the year, where he really held Andre Wadsworth down, had a lot of help. He held a tight end in, he had max protection. But that game against Andre Wadsworth, I think, propelled Mo Collins into the first round and maybe affected his decision to leave Florida early, knowing that if you can dominate arguably the best player in the draft, or at least neutralize him, then that gives him an opportunity to maybe come in as a first-round draft choice. We so often find ourselves projecting so-called skill players into offenses. This is one where Mo Collins comes out of a Florida offense that is used to getting rid of the football quick. He's used to operating without people outside of him. All of a sudden, he goes into Oakland now where John Gruden's going to put in an offense where he's got a quarterback who gets rid of the ball quick in Jeff George. This is a case where you have an offensive lineman that actually comes out of a college system that fits very nicely into a professional system in Oakland. So it's a nice fit for him as well as an offensive lineman with a lot less things to learn than if he had to go to a, a longer drop-back style of offense. Well, let's clean the trade up here for a moment. Oakland has three picks between you know, in the second round. They got 31 and 59 as a result of the Chester McLaughlin trade. So they hold on to 31, but they give up their regular second round pick, number 34, and the pick that they acquired from uh, the Chiefs as a result of Kansas City two days ago or yesterday signing Chester to McLaughlin. So Oakland has one second round pick left. Tampa Bay gets their other second round picks and Oakland gets Mo Collins. For more reaction to Mo Collins heading to uh, the Silver and Black, let's go up to Chris Fowler and the coach. Well, Boomer, Mo Collins becomes the third offensive lineman taken in this first round. Here's a guy who was playing against the highest possible college competition from a very early time in his career at Florida. Never forget the Fiesta Bowl. Collins very much overmatched by those Nebraska outside pass rushers as a young tackle there. We're not able to block anybody, and Danny Werfel got killed. But Mo Collins, as Mel mentioned, guys, progressed along, was able to play very well against Andre Wadsworth and those Florida State outside pass rushers later in his career. Guy likes to do a lot of talking as well as blocking, though. <laughs> well, Chris, when you look at Mo Collins, you look at 96, he played against Andre Wadsworth and uh, Peter Boulware and Renard Wilson, and the two outside guys, Wilson and Boulware, he played very well against them. Last year, with a little help from the tight end, he was able to shut out Andre Wadsworth. The, the problem is he's not a very good run blocker and can get overweight on you a little bit, but comes out of a very good system of Steve Spurrier, good pass protector. What is overweight in this draft? Now, they had 58 <laughs> college linemen at the Combine, 51 of them were over 300 pounds, <laughs> How does he fit into the offensive scheme of the Raiders? Though? Well, it, it should be a real nice fit. Remember, John Gruden is coming there and he's going to put in a new style of offense, the West Coast offense. And what we really want to look at is going to the playbook right here. We look at the pre-play, and here's the position he will play right there. And now in John Gruden's style of offense, the fullback is an important pass receiver, so he's going to get out of the backfield quick. That means Moe is going to have to set quick and either block that end coming there against this over front or this tackle coming in here. And the key is to stop the penetration coming up the field because the quarterback will set in three and five step drops. Critical. So when you have this position or this position at the tackle and you're throwing short, quick pass in the West Coast, Coast offense, it is critical that the quarterback has lanes to throw to the fullback and to the halfback and to the short inside routes of the wide receiver. This is a real good pick for John Gruden because he wants to solidify the offensive line. He, he likes to run the football, but the key will be the quick, short, crisp passing game. So Mo Collins joins Fred Taylor in this year's first round. Last year the Gators had a couple of first round picks. Steve Spurrier before last year, Chris Berman, had not had an offensive player taken in the first round in his regime at Florida and Jacquez Green could make it a third this year. Uh, Bellwether certainly, uh, he's one of the most intriguing players in the entire draft. A Bay Area scoop, Tommy. Mo Collins playing for the Raiders and when he's good, he's very good. Yeah, the thing is, is Mo Collins has massive, a massive frame, long arms, 355 pounds, six four and a half. The thing that he does well is get arm extension. He gets his arms out and forces people around him. We'll take a look at Mo Collins here. Initially, at the left tackle spot, you're gonna see him get out right away. And get right tackle and get those arms out and you see him right there with the great thrust. Working here against Andre Wadsworth. 
best defensive player in the draft here. Again, you see him make that end, take the long route around. Now, the wrap on Mo Collins is that he is inconsistent at times. But when he had to raise his level of play, a la Andre Wadsworth, he did an outstanding job. And the thing we want to talk about here is that arm extension here. Remember, he's 6'4 and a half, 355 pounds. When he gets those arms out and he extends, it's going to have make force you to take the long route around about a day and a half, boom. The long route, the polar route, uh, so to speak, uh, Tommy. And it's interesting, as Mo Collins is a Raider, his father spent a season with the Kansas City Chiefs in 1975. Both sides of that rivalry. Hey, Samaxi in the stands. Jubin, around the clock. We'll be back. Here we go. The NFC Eastern champion, New York football giants are on the clock. They've made their pick. The fans will find out who it is. With the... Uh, 24th pick in the first round, the New York Giants select defensive back from UCLA, Sean Williams. Value, value, value. A player that we didn't think would be in this spot, Mel. And I, I don't think that's where they were. They originally were headed, but when he dropped, he's a good value, wouldn't he? Well, I think when you look at the Giants, you say, well, the safety positions look pretty good. They have Sam Garns, who, of course, was an outstanding fifth-round pick last year out of Cincinnati, but they lost Thomas Randolph in free agency, who was kind of their nickel back. And, of course, they, they're strong at corner with Seahorn and certainly with Felipe Sparks. You watch Sean Williams. He's an attacker, an aggressive uh, free safety. Uh, they're on the sack. He's a big kid. He's about 210 pounds, 6'1 and a quarter. He'll hit you. He's also a very good center fielder. And I think the all-around skills that Sean Williams provides, in addition, when you look at him at 210, he has some pure cornerback skills, but he's all over the field. I mean, he's a guy, when you look talking to Steve Atwaters and, of course, what Ronnie Lott developed into after he moved the cornerback to safety, that's what you're hoping, that UCLA has had that great tradition at safety of developing NFL players, and Sean Williams gives them a lot of versatility in terms of their nickel package and their dime package as a rookie. First uh, defensive back drafted in the first round for the Giants since 1983, Terry Kennard. Let's go to Chris Mortensen in Miami for some reaction. Mort? Well, uh, Chris, and speaking with uh, Ernie Corsi, the new general manager of the New York Giants, uh, of course, he had assisted George Young the past few years. Ernie anticipated that this was very much a possibility. I spoke to him early or middle of the week, and he said, hey, if Sean Williams falls to me, it's going to be tough to pa pass on him. He would probably be the highest rated player on the board, even though they needed an offensive lineman, Alan Fanica, uh, LSU, Flozo Adams, uh, one of the guys we were discussing. They even need a speed receiver like Jack has green. But he said, Sean Williams, too good to pass up, and Mel Kuyper is exactly right. They need somebody to cover in nickel situations. Sean Williams, I know uh, Ernie is thrilled to have him, Chris. Well, they had nickel coverage in the game against the Vikings. They would have been moving on, right? Exactly. Right. Right. One play, but that's true. Ward mentioned it, and, it yeah. and it's true. Um, let's look at the board now, Mel, because Sean Williams was excellent value. Who now? You know what we have not had, and we thought we would, and maybe it's starting now. The run. It's a defensive back run. Right. We thought that would happen about eight spots above. They've had Jones and Williams. Now what? Well, I think you look at Corey Chavis. I think the question there is, if he got by Minnesota, that's the thing. If, if, if Moss would have been gone, would Minnesota have taken Chavis? Now how far does he slide? A lot of questions about can he be a corner or, or is he a safety? I think he's an outstanding corner. I think he'll be a steal for somebody. Flozell Adams, you know, senior year wasn't spectacular because of the ankle, but he's a bookend tackle. But quarters, you got to like. I mean, versatile, was on the field 80% of the time, offense and defense. Victor Riley, if he becomes more intense and consistent, he's got some mobility. Brian Kelly, you know, he had the, the subpar work out, then a better workout was it enough to recover and get in the first round. Robert Holcomb, you have to believe the Kansas City Chiefs yes. will think very seriously about Robert Holcomb late in the first round. These are good players. I mean, I, I mean these, these then, are guys, again, some, right? Exactly, Chris. I think you look at Bob Hallen, the versatility. Alan Fanica, a rugged Pittsburgh Steeler style of offensive guard. Leonard Little could be an outside backer in the right scheme or a defensive Three, end. Three-four player. Owen Kruitz will play 10 or 12 years anchoring a line at the center position. Jeremy Stott, one year as a starter. And look at the great job he did clogging the middle at Arizona State. Leon Bender, an athletic 318-pounder. Sertain, a guy very underrated at Southern Miss. Cleveland, his great individual workout, moved him into the early uh, second round area. And there's Mitch Marrow, 
Interesting kid. You talk about the Ivy League. Last year, Marcellus Wiley, a very strong second-round pick for the Buffalo Bills. They really like his potential. I think when you look at Seth Payne, uh, draft choice in the fourth round to Jacksonville last year, this kid, Marrow, has been a workout warrior. You say, well, he didn't make a lot of plays as a senior. He had mononucleosis. He had a turf toe injury. As a junior, he played very well. But his workouts have been unbelievable. He's 285 pounds, and he can play defensive tackle or defensive end. I think Mitch Marrow goes in the early second round. You think so? Mm -hmm. From? University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Brunswick School, Greenwich, Connecticut. Well, those are the next group of names that we'll get to know. Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, San Francisco, Miami, Denver. And the first round will be history here in New York. We'll be back. We're back in New York, and certainly a familiar sight to all football fans in New York is that man, George Young, uh, VP General Manager for the Giants for 19 years, years and years and years. Now we're working with the league and assisting Cleveland in the re-entering of uh, the National Football League. 10 out of 19 seasons with the Giants, a uh, winning season, and, and really did it with eras of Parcells, Reeves, and Fossil. So did it at three uh, different coaching regimes, um, has had playoff success. And so uh, George Young moves on. Ernie Acorsi, who once upon a time ran to, was uh, with Cleveland, with Baltimore. He's now joining us on our uh, Sprint uh, video teleconferencing. And Ernie, you made your first draft pick now as Giants GM. And I got to think you feel you got excellent value there with uh, Sean Williams. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, we had him uh, rated so much higher than what was available at the point that we selected that uh, actually it was an easy choice. What do you, when you sit there in a draft room, and you've been in many, and you start to notice, well, you know, about eight picks from where you are, he hasn't gone yet, and then it's seven, then it's six. Do you, do you have any nails left on your fingers? Or, I mean, what, what do you do at that point? Hold your breath? Well, you, you start to, uh, actually, it, that's the emotional part of it. It's not putting the players in order. It's when the... Uh, players that you covet start going off the board and when one starts uh, you, you don't want to hope too hard because you don't want to jinx it but when you have a player rated that high and uh, he starts to fall then yeah you do start counting the minutes and especially in the first round where there are 15 minutes between picks uh, there are long 15 minute intervals Ernie Mel Kuyper Ernie I just want to Hi, ask Mel. you how you doing, Aaron? I just want to say, you know, last year in the first round, top 10 pick, Ike Hilliard. He had a great start in training camp, looked like he was going to have a great rookie season, onward to an outstanding career. Then the neck injury. What's his status right now, and how do you feel he'll be in 98? Well, we're very optimistic about him. He had uh, significant testing in the last four weeks, passed them all, has been given a complete green light mail to participate in the entire off-season program and in the mini camps and for training camps. So. Uh, medically, he's, uh, he's recovered completely, and he has a champion's heart, as you know, so I don't think there's any question in our mind that, that it will have him back uh, better than ever. Ernie, uh, this is Chris again. I'm not asking you to try and tip your hand in, in coming picks at all, but there it looks to be, from afar, a real flux of change in the running back situation for the Giants. Rodney Hampton, will he be back? Uh, Wheatley, will he be back? Will there be full-scale changes do you see come June? Well, Chris, we have LaShawn Johnson, who we signed from the Cardinals, Tyrone Wheatley, Rodney Hampton, and, of course, Charles Way. Uh, and, you know, our feeling is that, that we're in pretty good shape there. I, that's not to say we won't add somebody else, but we have depth there. And actually, you know, we had uh, our bellwether was Hampton for so long, and he's been the leading ground gator in the history of the franchise. And, and what we're trying to do, really, uh, because he missed most of last year, is to stockpile as much talent as we can there, and we, we still may add some more. So it really hasn't filtered out yet. We did give Rodney Hampton an opportunity to talk to other clubs. We thought he deserved that. We did not want to hold on to him to a point where if we decided that it would be best if he left, that there wouldn't be any time left for him to make a deal. So he is talking to other clubs. He's also going to talk to us. So it's still possible that he would, if he wants to stay with us and we want him, it's still possible that he'll remain a Giant. Well, Ernie, a uh, heck of a start here on draft day for you as uh, GM of the Giants. May a player you're looking for uh, in the late second round fall from the middle second round. You're one for one on making the grab there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Mel. All right, we return Jacksonville with their pick followed by the Pittsburgh Steelers. 